Welcome. This is our third annual uh, NIH Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Festival. Um, it is great to have all of you here. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm Bill Riley, a director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research here at the NIH. Uh, my pleasure in terms of opening remarks and welcome to introduce one of the deputy directors of NIH and the director of the Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives, Jim Anderson. Jim. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. I, I think that people should hold their applause until after somebody speaks, because you never know what you got yourself into. So I want to welcome you to this third uh, annual event. Uh, this, this is organized by the NIH Behavioral Social Science Research Coordinating Committee and staff from Bill's office, the Office of Behavioral Social Science Research. I want to thank everybody who was involved in uh, doing what needed to get done to get it to happen. Uh, I also want to give a very special welcome to our funded investigators and their trainees. And throughout the day, we're going to highlight some of the uh, influential science that you all have been conducting. Uh, we've also built into the schedule time for uh, opportunities for everyone to do some networking. And I especially want to invite the trainees to find members of our program staff uh, and discuss your career development questions and funding opportunity and how to, how to create your career in behavioral social science research uh, through NIH. The presentations today, I noticed, are going to cover a wide range of topics. I want to call out one that's not particularly highlighted today, uh, but it's really an emerging area we're watching carefully at NIH. Uh, and I'd say maybe we're behind the rest of the world in doing this, but it's looking for opportunities to uh, work with big data and machine learning, artificial intelligence approaches to, to extracting information that you, we can't easily see as a human being. So why do I say this is an emerging area? One of the, it's of interest to our director, so it's emerging. And <laughs> Francis held a big workshop uh, about half a year ago and invited some leaders across the field of artificial intelligence to sort of look for where we could begin to apply it more effectively in biomedical and behavioral social science research. That was a fascinating, uh, uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, a second example, um, the Common Fund is one of the activities that's funded through our division. Uh, and this is, uh, it funds, it's about $600 million now, and it funds only about 25 programs at a time. They're short, they're five to 10 years, and they take on really a goal-driven approach to solving a problem. So it's things like the microbiome, but it's also the uh, behavioral social science program, uh, the science of behavior change uh, is a common fund program. Uh, it has dozens of investigators. This fiscal year, it's about a $16 million investment, so big programs. And they take on something that's across NIH and relevant to lots of institutes. So, we try different ways to get ideas for common fund programs. And this year, we had meetings with uh, several dozen journal editors, including lots from behavioral social science that uh, Bill suggested. And I have to say that uniformly, these editors said, you have to use big data. You have to use machine learning. There's lots there that we see coming across our desk. And it's really something that I just to focus on. So, I uh, just want to point out that this is something that's on our radar, and it's going to, it's going to require new, new transdisciplinary working teams. And I see one of your topics today is thinking about gaps in training and the future. Uh, and I would suggest that we all think about how to get computationally savvy folks more focused on behavioral science uh, research areas so we can use the data. Um, so, with that, it's a, it looks like a great program today, and I'm going to hand it back over to Bill to get you going. Thank you. Now you can clap if you want to. Thanks so much, Tim. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I can get slides going. Should be next. I got it. I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Oh, good. 
Okay. All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my opportunity now to uh, speak a bit about the state of our science. Um, I enjoy every year kind of reflecting back on what we've done in the past year and the things that we've worked on, the types of things that we're doing. Um, I also think it's a, a bit uplifting for those of us in the trenches on a day-to-day -day basis to sort of reflect back on the things that we've, we've done and the accomplishments that we've made. So um, spent a little time on that today. Whoop, didn't want to do that. But let me do this. Or try that. At some point, we'll get this to work. There we go. All right. So I'm going to, um, all of the NI, uh, all OBSR, uh, OBSSR has continually sort of grounded its work within our strategic plan for the uh, next five years from 2017 to 21. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the things that our office is doing and, and organize that around some of our scientific priorities. Um, just a reminder for those of you who don't know, so there are three scientific priorities within the um, OBSSR strategic plan, uh, the basic and applied research synergy to try to move basic to applied research a little bit more smoothly, improvements in methods and measures and data infrastructures and uh, application and adoption um, of behavioral and social science research. Um, and then foundational processes that we've done since the, what, 24 years that we've been in existence as OBSSR, communication, program coordination and integration, training and policy and evaluation efforts. So just a few highlights from each of these. Um, in our basic um, space, we continue to support the OpNet effort. Um, as you know, this is a trans-NIH effort to um, fund basic uh, research in the behavioral and social sciences. Um, a couple of things that have happened in this last year are mid-career training to integrate behavioral and social science research um, that's already out, and interdisciplinary research teams to study linkages between sleep and stress. So there have been a number of um, these more trans-NIH efforts where the basic science doesn't really have a home in any one particular institute or center, and it's the sort of thing that OpNet, I think, does quite well. And continue, we um, just created another basic behavioral and social science research committee to help sort of foster sort of new ideas um, for um, funding announcements um, coming out of OpNet. Uh, we've been pretty busy with the BRAIN initiative. Um, as you know, year, the first five years of the BRAIN initiative were primarily to develop uh, new tools and new processes and new procedures for understanding the connectivity of the brain. Um, we're now shifting into phase two of that where we actually will use those tools and procedures to be able to better understand not only diseases but behaviors as well. And in that space, um, we've already had a meeting as part of the BRAIN initiative on brain behavior quantification, an attempt to sort of try to match the temporal density and precision that we're now getting from, um, from the brain sort of processes that we're able to understand and match those up a little bit better with behavioral processes as we understand them in terms of temporal density. And we continue to support a bench to bedside program, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, um, which is how we do some support for intramural and the movement between basic to applied in that as well. We've been pretty busy in scientific priority two in the last year. Just uh, last month, we launched the Longitudinal Analysis of Health Behaviors Network. Uh, this is seven um, projects um, whose intent is to measure in a very temporally dense, precise manner um, behaviors over time and their contextual factors and the influences of those behaviors. So smoking, physical activity, um, suicide, uh, ideation, those types of things, and monitor them more intensively over time. And not so much do what we've done for many years, which is try to understand differences between people, but to actually understand differences within people over time and what influences those changes over time. So they'll be actually um, leveraging a lot of the sensor technologies that are sort of up and coming in the field, but they'll also be leveraging what Jim has talked about already, which is some of the sort of more predictive modeling and uh, computational modeling approaches to understand those behaviors over time as well. Um, released a uh, mentored career enhancement in M Health technology um, recently. Um, one of the things I also wanted to focus on was our pre-doctoral training in advanced data analytics for behavioral and social science research. This is a T32, our first foray as an office into the T32 mechanism um, to integrate data science and behavioral and social sciences into an integrated training program that will enhance some of the uh, very sort of big data sort of efforts that we're trying to do. Um, that's actually still out on the street to, um, for people to respond to. 
Um, we do an annual methodology workshop for the NIH staff. Many of you who are in this audience come to that on a regular basis, and we appreciate that as well. This year's was on predictive modeling and the behavioral and social sciences. Um, and we're continuing to work with the National Center of Health Statistics now on the accessibility and timeliness of the National Death Index to make those data more available and more easily available to researchers um, who are funded by the NIH. So more on that hopefully next year when we talk about this. And then in Scientific Priority 3, uh, Social Determinants of Health, um, uh, we, we along with NCI and a number of other agencies a few years back, uh, funded an IOM report on capturing social and behavioral phenomena within the electronic health record. Um, our concern at the time was electronic health records were increasingly being used for research, and there was very little social and behavioral data within those electronic health records. So that effort was to try to improve that. A lot has actually been done in that space. Um, but this was a follow-up meeting that we had this year to sort of uh, assess what has been done in terms of putting those types of data into the system and how it's being used and what it's being used for, both for research purposes but also for uh, clinical care management and that sort of thing as well. Um, advancing our dissemination and implementation and also our de-implementation research through working groups and public-private partnerships. We work with NCCIH this year on an emotional well-being conference. And after many years of NCI's leadership in this, we took back over the organization and coordination of the TITER training, the DNI training for uh, young researchers um, we're trying to get more into the DNI space. I won't spend a lot of time here, and within our foundational processes, um, there's a number of things that uh, we continue to do. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, um, we do a communicating science workshop that we did just last year. Um, I think our office feels a particular need to be able to train ourselves and others in how to communicate our science better to different work groups and different types of people um, so they understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, we continue to do our director's webinar series. We'll actually sort of reduce that over this next year instead of once a month. I think we're starting to feel this saturation point starting to happen. We'll start doing those just three or four times a year, and those are available to anyone. And I'll talk a little bit more about our translational behavioral medicine commentary corner in a minute. Um, we worked with a pain management collaboratory. Um, we have a trans NIH measurement group to focus specifically on the measurement, trans NIH measurement efforts that go on here at the NIH and a behavioral clinical trials interest group that we've developed. Um, in the training space, we talked already about a bit about the tighter training. We've continued to support R25s. These are mostly the summer um, uh, training institutes um, that are funded by our office. There are eight of them that are funded um, currently for this year, um, and the R25 was just released yesterday on the street for the next round. Um, so those are out there and available for people to respond to as well. And it's a nice way for people in the field to get just an, an extra sort of piece of, of uh, more advanced methodology and other approaches and research for that. And also supported the RCT and most training um, efforts for the last few years as well. Um, on evaluating um, the impact of behavioral and social sciences, this is one of the things that our office does is probably the least seen, right? Because if we do it well, nobody pays any attention to us. It's only when we do it poorly that you probably do, right? It's sort of how do we handle policy issues as they come down the pike? How do we respond to them? How do we make sure that behavioral and social sciences are included and are, uh, considered as these policies come out, that sort of thing? Um, we've gone to a, um, thanks to Deepa Kipsey's efforts, an electronic co-funding process, and when I, so when I talk about co-funding, we'll now be making that much easier for people to do. Um, a parallel social and behavioral science research administrator position that we've uh, developed thanks to Christine Hunter's um, efforts with uh, uh, human resources in that space. We were having difficulty hiring some people who were fairly basic or not quite what they would consider to be health-related uh, disciplines. Um, and so this allows us to expand that into spaces we weren't able to do before and continue to support our clinical trial policy implementation and outreach. Okay. Just a few sample of publications. Just, just thinking about the, um, the communication efforts. So this is just a few of the um, publications from OBSSR staff. Um, I would not have been able to fit them all on a, a single slide, so these are just a few samples of them. Um, people have been busy. Um, they, they do all the work that they're supposed to do for the NIH and all the work they're supposed to do for the OBSSR, and then in addition to that, spend a little time, I think mostly nights and weekends for writing, but uh, getting some work done in that area as well. 
Um, one of the things that we continue to do is um, coordinate a funder's corner with translational behavioral medicine. Uh, this is one of the Society of Behavioral Medicine's flagship journals. Um, and fund just a brief commentary um, on a topic area of importance to the behavioral and social sciences here at the NIH so people are aware of that. I bring that up primarily because if you have ideas of things, you're thinking about something that would be nice to write an article about that's relatively short um, as a commentary. Um, those are the sorts of things that we're, we're always looking for to give the community a better sense of the types of things that we're working on. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about research funding. Uh, it's what the people always want us to focus on is our, where's our money and are we giving you any? Um, and we're doing well. Um, it's been helpful that in the last couple of years, obviously, NIH has seen a significant bump in its overall budget from Congress, and so we've been able to distribute those funds even better. And that bump actually shows up in the behavioral and social science research work that we do as well. Um, so as you can see, we're up, if you look at sort of the count of or the amount of money spent on grants that have a behavioral or social science aspect to them. Now, keep in mind, some are sort of very clearly behavioral and social science, some are sort of more peripherally that, but they count within the RCDC criteria as being a behavioral and social science research effort. Um, that's increased to getting close to $5 billion a year um, in funding over the course of time for each year. Um, with a slight increase in basic behavioral research as well within that. That's what the BBSSR means. Um, so we've had a good group in that. Um, for FY18, uh, NIA was the winner um, for um, the amount of funding in behavioral and social science research this year. Um, I think that's partly reflected in the um, increased budget that they've received for Alzheimer's research, which is really sort of pushed that effort even more forward than they've already ha always had a strong sort of behavioral and social science um, effort at NIA and pushed that forward a bit. Um, oh, we did what it always does. For some reason, in a different format, it drops out every other <laughs> um, institute. So you have to imagine what the institutes are in between. Um, on my slides, they show NIMH being right under NIA. That's what the gap is there. Um, so what we'll do is we'll make sure we share slides with you that actually have the names of all of those uh, when we're doing this uh, moving forward. Um, but as you can see, it, the, there is some behavioral and social science research that's funded by nearly every institute and center here at the NIH. It partly reflects how much the focus they have, but it also just reflects how large their budget happens to be. So some of the smaller ones at the bottom are ones that have relatively small budgets, and within that relatively small budget, they still fund a substantial proportion of behavioral and social science research. Okay. Um, I want to spend just a minute on this. We've, um, for the, uh, since I started at OBSSR, um, had some concerns about could we do a better job of tracking the behavioral and social science resource portfolio? And could we do that in part by being able to look in more detail at the sort of subsets or subcategories of work? Um, I'm going to take a minute here to tell you how wonderful our health science policy analysts are <laughs> at, at OBSSR. Um, we have four that are just outstanding. Um, a number of them worked on this. Aaron Spaniel um, primarily sort of brought this home. Um, I'll also mention Julian Aka, who did most of the analyses for these slides as well, um, just in terms of giving a shout out. But uh, we worked with the Office of Portfolio Analysis and continue to work with them on how we better characterize the behavioral and social science research portfolio. Um, using sort of machine learning approaches initially and then working our way toward keywords over the course of um, the efforts and various iterations of this, came up with 13 sort of subcategories um, that reflect some of the content areas that we can better track those. Now, these are not mutually exclusive. Um, they differ from um, one to the other, and you can be in one, two, or even three in a given grant, but at least gives us an idea of kind of over time we can track funding within certain subcategories of research. So as you can see, those are pretty evenly distributed. They're probably the most uh, research that we fund are in grants that have a focus on attention, learning, and memory, um, but also a decent amount on healthcare and disease management, on developmental processes and family health-related factors. And um, then as you can see, as you go around, so those are the processes and determine. It's just a number of areas with a fairly reasonable sort of dispersion of those across those various content areas. Um, each year, I struggle with how do I tell you about the over 3,000 new uh, grants that are behaviorally and social science focused um, and do that within a half an hour um, uh, presentation. 
Uh, I think one year I did an example grant from the 10 smallest. I think last year I did it from the 10 largest. So this year we're going to do one from each of those particular sort of subcategories just to give you a sense. So this is research on neurocognitive dynamics of, of learning uh, and executive function, uh, looking at the process by which learning occurs uh, as a central aspect of um, executive function development over time and how the brain processes that and how it learns that over time. So following children longitudinally from age two to five um, to do that work. In the social processes and determinants area, this is dissemination implementation of a safe environment for every kid model. This is the, the effort to um, use some of the prevention strategies we understand and know um, for child abuse and neglect and incorporate them more into family practice and primary care and pediatrics so that those um, health care providers can provide some of the services necessary to prevent child abuse and neglect over the course of time. Um, in the mental health space, we, I particularly picked this because everybody says, well, mental health is just how, all you have to do is pull up what NIMH funds. Well, um, obviously, there's a lot of emotional and cognitive research that is funded by the other institutes as well. Um, this is from um, the nursing research on the emotional processing and some of the mechanisms understanding why art therapy tends to work uh, with breast cancer palliative care patients and reducing depression, anxiety, and other sort of distress, emotional distress efforts. And, and how that impacts things like pro-inflammatory cytokine expression and those types of things. Um, in the healthcare and disease management, uh, this is promoting resilience and stress management intervention. Um, so um, studying how to understand the treatment of stress management and resilience um, efforts in adolescents and young adults with advanced cancer. Um, so another sort of uh, really nice uh, randomized control study looking at that type of work. I know you can't read these abstracts as quickly as I'm going through them, but they'll be available as we go. Um, so developmental processes in family health, this is the impact of multi-level risk and resilience factors on cardiovascular health and racially and ethnically diverse men and women. Um, so this is work on um, trying to improve um, the cardiovascular health in three cohorts and, and coordinate that effort on some of the cohorts that NI uh, and HLBI has led for a number of years. And so we're pooling that data together. So it's a really nice data integration um, effort in that space. Okay. Uh, this is work in addictive behaviors, understanding relapse and impact of social networks and geographic settings during the treatment of alcohol-related problems. Um, and some of the work in understanding context and the types of things that are associated with relapse and studying those in more detail and with greater specificity than we've done in the past. So this is a, a way for people to be able to understand contextual factors, and including GPS location and how it impacts or relapse um, among uh, those with alcohol abuse. Um, in the stress, trauma, and resilience area, this is uh, mobile and web-based behavioral intervention for improving caregiver well-being. Um, as you know, caregivers are under a significant amount of stress um, dealing with their um, um, ill loved ones, and this is a, a nice effort to address some of the efforts and some of the issues that they have to deal with along the way. In the food intake and physical activity area, um, this is work by NIDDK, a large-scale randomized trial on nutri nutrition labeling interventions, sort of looking at different ways that we label nutritional information and whether those differences have an impact on what selections people make in terms of food selection and that sort of thing, particularly for beverages. Um, and this is in the Philadelphia area where they're also doing um, a 1.5 uh, cent per ounce beverage tax beginning in January of last year to look at the impact of that as well. Um, in the pain, injury, and disability area, this is um, one of the many opioid um, studies that are starting to come down the pike now um, as a result of some of the opioid efforts. Um, so opioid treatment and recovery in a safe pain management program. Uh, so this uses a number of factors and does a, one of the um, more innovative sort of step wedge cluster randomized control studies to compare the clinical um, effectiveness of these approaches um, for clinical decision support care and that sort of thing in people um, with pain um, complaints. And then in the sensation and perception area, this is an early language and literacy acquisition in children with hearing loss. Um, as you know, um, the ability to sort of um, attain and, and understand speech and language is substantially impaired in those who have early hearing loss. And this is a, a study to help understand sort of what's the process and how does that work and what could we potentially do to improve the ability of people to, with hearing loss to be able to um, develop language um, and literacy acquisition uh, more readily. 
And then in our language and communication disorders area, this is data-driven multidimensional modeling of nonverbal communication and typical and atypical development. Um, among the things that um, children with autism and autism spectrum disorder have difficulty doing is being able to understand and read nonverbal cues. Um, Sheldon on Big Bang Theory is a good example of why, that's, or why that happens. Um, but so this is looking at learning probabilistic latent models for movement data to, to really sort of get a better understanding of exactly what is going on, how do we categorize these nonverbal behaviors, and what is it that they're specifically missing um, as they do that work. And then the sexual behavior space, this is increasing engagement, improving HIV care outcomes via stigma reduction. Uh, racially diverse uh, young men who have sex with men and transgender women. Uh, so um, another of sort of the strong um, set of research that's funded in the HIV area um, in HIV prevention um, and treatment. And then finally, um, on sleep, the impact of sleep-wake circuits on cortical synapse plasticity during motor learning. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in terms of memory consolidation during various aspects of sleep, and this is a study to better understand what those processes are and how they function and what kind of things are going on there. So that's just a quick and a very quick rapid sampling, but to give you a sense of some of the, the real things out of the thousands of research studies that were funded this year by the NIH in the behavioral and social sciences. Um, the, all of you, many of you uh, who are NIH staff have been busy uh, with funding announcements over the last year. This is just a, again, a highlight of a few. Uh, from OpNet, the short-term mentor uh, career enhancement awards that I mentioned before, and interdisciplinary research teams on sleep and stress. NIDEK has had a number having to do with obesity policy and obesity uh, development in children and those sorts of things. NCI has um, work it's been doing in research to improve Native American health and those sorts of things. Uh, this is NIDA's work on behavioral integrative treatment development program and one of their longstanding programs to support intervention development, um, as well as psychosocial stress and opioid use patterns and responding to opioid use disorders in tribal communities. Um, as you know, NIH has gotten considerable funding for um, opioid research, and over the course of this coming year, there'll be a number of um, funding announcements that will be coming out in that area as well. So this is just some of the earlier stuff in that space. Uh, just some more, I won't read all of these to you. NINDS, of course, has a number of these that are related to the BRAIN Initiative, um, since a number of those are related to some of the work that uh, we do and support and help to uh, support. Um, so just to give you a sense of what some of these are. Um, the one at the bottom actually is one uh, follow-up from one of the projects that was an OpNet project and then followed up with a FOA um, looking at multi-sensory processing um, efforts. Okay. And then for OBSSR, these are some of the things that we've led in the last year. Um, methodology and measurement behavioral social sciences is still out. Um, I mentioned before our pre-doctoral T32 um, announcement on data science and behavioral science and the integration of those things. Uh, we continue to fund an education and health sort of integration. How does education impact um, health and what are the mechanisms by which that happens? Um, work on population health inter interventions in which we try to do a better job of integrating individual level interventions with more group community um, dynamics or interventions along the way. Um, our sense is that the field has typically either done one or done the other, or when they say they're doing both, the other one is sort of a token um, relative to the other thing. So we really would like to see more work that really in integrates individual-based sort of interventions with more um, community and um, social-based interventions. Uh, we still have out our revision applications for the validation of mobile and wireless health tools, um, improving patient adherence. This is part of the adherence network um, effort to improve patient adherence to treatment prevention regimens to promote health, and then short-term career enhancement awards as well. So those are just some of the funding announcements that OBSSR has led with many of you and many of your efforts um, along the way in signing on and helping us support these as we move forward. We spent a few minutes on our um, co-funding efforts over the past year. Um, now, for those of you who are not NIHers, um, we don't um, fund grants at OBSSR. Um, but what we do is if program staff come to us and say, from one of the other institutes come to us and say, we have a grant that we think is really good. It's kind of on the cusp. We'd like to fund it. Would you be able to help us? That's the sort of thing that OBSSR um, helps fund. 
Um, and in this year, I think close to 21 million of our 27 million went to those co-funding efforts um, over the course of the year. This gives you a sense of sort of where our funding has gone to the various institutes um, by year. Um, the blip that you see at NINDS in 2016 um, was a result of the, them being sort of in between one phase of the brain initiative and another phase of the brain initiative. And they particularly needed some funding for some research on linguistic um, processes and that sort of thing that we were able to do. So that's been very helpful. Um, but again, sort of, sort of who some of the people are and some of the institutes and what we funded over the course of time um, by institute. Um, some of the common themes, again, going back to our sort of 13 sort of subcategories, um, we've probably funded a bit more in social processes and determinants, and um, once again, every other one is lost, so I can't even tell you what the second one was, but um, I have to, I'm going to have to get, you know, PowerPoint to quit thinking for us. Um, addictive behavior, and you can see at least some of the sense of those, and again, when we make slides available, we'll make sure we include the, the other ones that are in between. Uh, just an example um, in terms of size, I, w I will tell you, I always worry about telling you the largest contribution because most of our co-funding is in the 100,000 to 200,000 range on average um, for any given grant or project. Um, but some of these, and, and some of these are ones where we've actually funded the full amount because it was really our project and the IC was just nice enough and kind enough to do that work. Um, the one at the top is the Eureka effort, the uh, Health ePeople's Resource for Mobilized Research. Um, to give those of you doing um, mobile health intervention research and measurement research a test bed that you could rapidly sort of deploy to um, do that work and get it done. So it's a, a nice sort of research resource available to uh, researchers to do that work. Um, but as you can see as you go down that list, a number of projects um, that we've um, funded over the course of the year and a, a pretty diverse group um, as you look at those. Um, oh, interesting, how things change on a different PowerPoint. Um, I can't even tell you what was in these little black spots that were there. The one in the middle is on the, one of the bench to bedside efforts. The bottom line in this is that um, we support at, NI, uh, at OBSSR um, some of the bench to bedside efforts, which is a, an, an effort of the intramural program to combine its work with some of the extramural researchers to be able to move basic research into the applied space. Um, we'll continue to do more work with intramural over the course of years, but this is one of the things that we've done for the last few years that um, we're very proud of and, and half, ha happy to help our intramural colleagues in that space. Um, we continue to have the Behavioral and Social Science Research Coordinating Committee, which is the, one of the sponsors of this event, and they've all worked very hard. Uh, this is the group that helps us keep the trains running and helps us coordinate efforts across all the various ICs. Um, we've had four working groups this year um, um, in that group. Um, one that's been very active has been the Clinical Trials Policy Working Group because we've had a lot of things going on with clinical trials policy and how it affects not only behavioral scientists more generally, but basic scientists more specifically. Um, a group working on behavioral ontologies and trying to better be able to categorize and have a better sort of control vocabulary for the constructs that we talk about so we're a little clearer about those as we move forward. Our basic and beyond work group um, that is working and looking at particularly that translational space from um, the basic research to the applied research space moving forward. And then a health behavior theories working group um, that's just sort of getting started and getting moving. So, um, so those are the things that they're working on at this current time, um, but at least gives you a sense of some of the things that that group is doing. Um, I will spend a second on the opioid and pain crisis. Um, that we've been working with the HEAL initiative of the NIH on for the last year. Um, back in the summer of last year, um, NIH did a series of workshops uh, that were mostly predominantly biomedical in nature and mostly focused on uh, sort of new um, analgesics for pain management that were less addicting and new approaches for um, opioid dependence um, that could be uh, considered and, and research um, directions in that space. Um, so we worked with the HEAL initiative and with NIH leadership uh, to put together this meeting in March that would focus specifically on the social and behavioral contributions um, to the opioid crisis and the types of things we could do, both in terms of things we already know that could be put into the field right now, as well as things in the future that could be used fairly quickly to do research on and move the space forward um, more quickly. 
Um, so there were five sort of areas in there. One was on social, cultural, and social economic underpinnings of the crisis. Those of you who know Case and Deaton's work and others are aware of some of the sort of underlying factors that are sort of driving some of the opioid crisis and sort of the deaths of despair um, that we see in the, in the um, community and in the population right now. Some of the behavioral and social factors for preventing opioid initiation and for mitigating the transition from acute to chronic opioid use and how can we do a better job of doing that. Um, some of you may have seen um, Jason Doctor's work that was published this year um, at some a very, really very basic sort of understanding of how we do things like um, survivor bias and, and those effects and how it influences um, opioid prescribing of physicians and doing a very simple thing, which is just giving physicians feedback on who actually has overdosed and who has actually died from the um, state death data. So they're aware of the people who didn't make it because they're only seeing the people who do made a substantial decrease in their opioid prescribing and how they did that. So it's those types of things that we looked at. I will mention, and this is one that bothers me every time I think about this meeting, um, the one of the um, presenters who talked about substance abuse prevention programs said that we have over 60 studies of effective substance abuse prevention programs, um, yet we still mostly, by and large, don't use them. We instead tell kids not to use drugs, which is not a very effective substance abuse prevention program. Right? So we have a lot to do on that dissemination implementation level to be able to get some of what we already know out. Um, some of the non-pharmacologic approaches for the treatment of opioid abuse and chronic pain management, which we've, again, had since the 1980s and probably have underutilized, but we also need to do a better job of how we um, do that work and the type of things that we do. So some research to improve both delivery of that and also the efficacy of those approaches is important. Um, overcoming barriers for prevention and treatment, and then following models of integrating these social and behavioral approaches into clinical and medical practice. Um, we continue with that effort now with a, a group that's a strategic planning committee um, made up of some of the people who were the NIH representatives to this March meeting to continue to sort of both, to do two things. One is to um, integrate into some of the existing initiatives that are coming out more social and behavioral um, research efforts within those. And the second is in places where there's a continued gap to look at other types of funding announcements we might be able to do in that space. Okay. We continue to do and work with a lot of our partners on these large trans NIH efforts, and if you're not familiar with them, I'll get you familiar quickly. We've already talked a bit about the BRAIN initiative, uh, the Science of Behavior Change initiative, um, which is one of the Common Fund's initiative, again, that um, comes out of the Common Fund in Jim's um, office, um, or division. This is um, work that um, NIA and uh, NIDCR and others have been funding. Um, for um, or is leading um, as a trans NIH initiative of the Common Fund for some time. Um, ECHO is the um, early um, work in child health and human development um, from infancy until age four, five, six, I forget how far up we're going, um, but looking at sort of pulling together um, uh, repositories and cohorts of um, patients and individuals over time and integrating that data to be able to get a better sense of the type of work going on. Adolescent brain and cognitive development, and in all of these we have put some funding into and we also have people who are working in these efforts. And then finally the All of Us program, um, which is getting off the ground quite quickly um, and getting to a million plus people that they'll follow over the course of um, many, many years. And of course, we have our um, regular OBSSR events. This was our Matilda White Riley Behavioral and Social Sciences um, Honors Awards that we held back in uh, May. Uh, Terry Moffitt was our distinguished lecturer for last year. Um, so we'll have another one of these coming up this coming um, April or May, usually in the spring is when we do these. So I uh, look forward to seeing all of you there for that as well. Um, and our early stage investigators on the left of your screen, um, one of the things we've done for the last two or three years is not just have a distinguished lecturer, but have a paper competition of people who qualify as an early stage investigator by the NIH definition less than 10 years since your terminal degree. Um, and ask for them to um, provide a paper. We had over 300 submissions this year for, um, to select four. Um, so there was some excellent work that was um, presented there as well. And again, like I said, oh, so I actually know when it is. It's June 6th, our 12th Matilda White Riley Behavioral and Social Science Research Awards. Um, and as I said, we've, we've been trying to sort of 
pared down instead of monthly webinars because we feel like everybody's having a webinar and as you're kind of getting saturated with webinars, we do probably a little less frequently, but try to make them a slightly bigger deal. Um, so we've got uh, the 2019 Directors Webinar uh, Series um, with a, a number of people that you already see there um, that we'll be presenting at those times. So. Um, finally, I want to thank the people who put this together, uh, Dana Green and Kate McNeil, uh, who co-chaired this, Alfonso Latoni, um, Michael Sterrett, Augie Diana, um, who were the coordinating committee members who put this together and um, helped make this such a successful meeting every year when we do this, such a nice festival. So I want to thank all of you. Thank you for your attention and your time. And I'm going to turn this over now uh, to Michael Sterrett, who's going to lead our first um, session of presentations. So thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Starrett, and I'm from the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, and I'm excited to be about uh, here at the festival today and to have the opportunity to moderate our first panel, uh, which will be focusing on basic social and behavioral processes. Uh, this promises to be a very interesting panel, and we have three terrific speakers for you today. I'll be introducing them all uh, now, and then after each uh, speaker, we'll have an opportunity for questions. Our first speaker will be Dr. Mark Jensen. Uh, Mark is from the University of Washington, and his talk is titled Cognitive Content, Cognitive Processes, and Adjustment to Chronic Pain. We'll then have Dr. Mauricio Delgado from uh, Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. Delgado will be talking about reflecting on the positive past, effects on stress and decision making. And then we'll close with Dr. Elliot Berkman from the University of Oregon. And Dr. Berkman will speak about promises and pitfalls of cognitive training for health behavior change. Each speaker has about 20 minutes for their talk, and afterwards we'll have up to five minutes for questions. So I encourage everyone to make use of the uh, microphones that are in the aisles. I think I'll also be able to bring this down into the aisles, and so maybe I can do my best impression of a Phil Donahue as well uh, to get your questions for these great speakers. So without further delay, uh, let's welcome Dr. Jensen. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here today. I'm very excited to present these data, which um, were, uh, were, as you'll see, uh, surprised us. Um, and I hope you'll be uh, surprised and intrigued as well. There we go. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, first talk about the rationale for the analyses that I'll be presenting, uh, present the findings, talk about the implications, and then talk about some future directions that we're going in based on, on the ideas presented. Um, so the idea behind the analyses that we performed here um, using baseline data of a clinical trial was to understand, um, started with the idea that cognitive content, what goes through your mind is important to function. It's the basic idea underlying cognitive therapy, the C in CBT, and the idea, of course, is that with good thoughts and good ideas, useful adaptive thoughts, we have good outcomes, and with negative thoughts, maladaptive thoughts, we don't have good outcomes. So cognitive therapy is about identifying the negative thoughts and morphing them into more positive, useful thoughts so that we'll be happier and behave in ways more consistent with our health. And cognitive therapy works. Um, the the um, studies support this idea. But of course, there's been, as you know, probably a third wave of, uh, of cognitive therapy, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, which talks about um, that it's not only what's important, what's in your mind, but what you do with what's in your mind, the process of our cognitions. And 
Um, therapies have come out, acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And, and these ideas, again, are that it's, it's not only um, what you think, but how you think. And they add this idea of acceptance, meditation, letting go of thoughts as a way to cope. Um, and the idea, again, is that, um, that there's these processes play a role in not only in function, but in how we um, respond to our thoughts. So there's this idea, for example, of cognitive fusion. If we're too connected to our thoughts and we have negative thoughts, then we'll possibly have worse outcomes. So the goal is to become more diffuse in our thinking, um, observe the thoughts and seeing them for what they are, just thoughts. We don't have to respond to them. So the idea here, the basic underlying idea, is that a state of cognitive diffusion, mindfulness, acceptance, may buffer the effects of negative thoughts on outcomes. So we have here, for example, um, an association between a negative thought, like catastrophizing, and some outcome, in this case, a pain intensity or pain interference. And with high catastrophizing, you have worse outcome. So if you can teach somebody to be more accepting or mindful, perhaps that'll um, moderate um, or buffer the, the negative effects of high catastrophizing. So we expect to see this um, pattern of associations. Um, but again, what about positive thoughts? Um, most of these theories and ideas have talked about, um, about the, how to buffer the effects of negative thoughts. But is it possible that you might be accepting of positive thoughts and then buffer their positive effects. We, that hasn't really been considered. Um, so maybe um, mindfulness might not be so good if you're having positive thoughts. Maybe it buffers the positive effects. Or maybe it helps for the, if you have a low positive thought, then maybe it will buffer that negative effect. So, or maybe it does a little bit of both. Um, we don't know yet about this, this aspect. So we wanted to do these analyses to look at this. So we did a set of analyses, again, using um, baseline data from a, a clinical trial to ask several questions. One, are the measures of cognitive content, what you think, really distinct from cognitive processes, how you think? Maybe the association among measures is so strong that you really can't empirically differentiate them. And if you can, um, do they really predict independent variance? Is there something about mindfulness, acceptance, that is important over and above the content of your thoughts or vice versa? And if they do predict independent variance, which ones are most important? Um, are they equally important? Is one more important than the other? And importantly for the analyses today, do they interact as predicted by models? So does being more acceptance and mind, more accepting and mindful actually buffer the effects of negative thoughts? So that was the idea for these analyses. We had 165 subjects from an ongoing trial, um, about average age, about 53, 57% um, women, and um, a variety of, uh, of race and ethnicities. To measure outcome, uh, we had three domains, so pain intensity, pain interference, or how much pain gets in the way of your day-to-day -day life, and depression. Cognitive content, what goes through the person's mind, we measured using the pain catastrophizing scale. Things like the pain is horrible, it's never going to get better, this pain is ruining my life. And for a positive thought, pain self-efficacy. Yes, I can manage this pain. For cognitive processes, we use the five-factor mindfulness questionnaire that assesses five components of mindfulness, observing, describing, acting with awareness, and non-judging and non-reactivity. So, for example, the non-judging item is I make judgments about whether my thoughts are good or bad. So it's a process. It's not about what you're thinking, but how you think about what you're thinking. Or I perceive my feelings and emotions without having to react to them. I can distance myself from them. Okay, so what, are, what about the results? First, are these measures distinct from each other? Um, and the answer is yes, for the most part. So um, I invite you to read every number on this slide to, to demonstrate that. Um, but no, in fact, they really separated out very nicely. Um, catastrophizing, self-efficacy, and the five factors. And interestingly, see if I get a pointer, um, the, uh, the, 
the two cognitive content ones, when there was overlap, tended to overlap with each other. So this kind of is a nice illustration that um, we can indeed measure cognitive content, what you think, separately from cognitive processes, how you think. The, the only real overlap was with respect to non-judging and catastrophizing, but otherwise they were quite distinct. So that was nice, that allowed us to move on to the next question, which was, do these, do cognitive content and, and uh, processes predict independent variants? So when you control for everything, um, can you, do each one predict something, something of function? And the answer was really only for depressive symptoms. Um, when you're predicting pain intensity, it really was only catastrophizing these negative thoughts about pain that stood out as most important. Um, processes didn't really contribute any variance over and above catastrophizing. And in this case, uh, pain self-efficacy didn't contribute anything over above catastrophizing. For predicting pain interference, again, it was content that was important. In this case, self-efficacy emerged as the more important of the two, but both catastrophizing about pain and self-efficacy about pain predicted independent variance in how much pain interferes with the person's life. Processes, not so important. But predicting depression, um, both did emerge. Um, again, catastrophizing and self-efficacy were important and it predicted independent variance, but also acting with awareness and non-judging. The more you acted with awareness and the more non-judgment you are, the less depressed uh, you, you described yourself. So it was a positive thing on average. Um, which was more important? Was one more important than the other? And the answer was cognitive content. So as it turns out, what goes through your mind is pretty important and more important than cognitive processes. But one, one way I like to think about this is if you want to lose weight, um, what's more important? What is in your refrigerator or what you do with what's in your refrigerator, content or process? And it turns out that what's in your refrigerator is particularly important, um, but what you do with it also plays a role. So uh, this is kind of a summary slide that shows, again, that it's, uh, it's content that's more important. Um, only pr process only predicted depressive symptoms, and even when it did, somewhat less so than the content measures. Okay, what about um, the interaction? And this is where it gets interesting. Um, yes, they, there was an interaction, but it was, in fact, the opposite is as we predicted. And... Um, so we predicted here that high mindfulness would buffer this effect. So you see a, a shallower uh, line there when you, uh, when you have more mindfulness. But in fact, um, so we'd expect something like this. This is the actual association we catastrophize in pain intensity. We'd expect this kind of buffering, but this is what we got, the opposite. More mindful meant catastrophizing had a stronger effect. So that was interesting and surprised us. We didn't expect this at all. Um, so being more mindful is bad when you catastrophize more. That's interesting. Okay, what about acting with awareness by catastrophizing? This significant interaction emerged. Again, we would have predicted this, but what we got um, was this. So... When catastrophizing is low is when mindfulness is best, acting with awareness. Um, when catastrophizing is high, being more mindful doesn't seem to help one way or the other. So un inconsistent with our, what we expected, mindfulness was not particularly helpful when catastrophizing is high, and it might even make things worse. So what about the interaction between positive thoughts and mindfulness. Uh, we expected one of these, that, that when you're more mindful, the positive thoughts might not be, um, have your effect so much on your life. We didn't know where this uh, line might be, but we expected something like this. In fact, this is what we got. Again, the opposite of what predict, was predicted. So more mindfulness seems to be good, but only when self-efficacy was high. So something about mindfulness kind of boosted the benefits of uh, self-efficacy um, rather than uh, buffered it. And again, this was the uh, predicted interaction. 
uh, when, uh, that we would have expected when, um, uh, with self-efficacy and pain interference, but again, we got the opposite effect. So more mindfulness was bad when self-efficacy was low. Um, so none of the significant, significant interactions that emerged uh, were consistent with the hypothesis that mindfulness buffered the effect of thoughts on pain or pain interference. And so to summarize then, um, yes, more catastrophizing and less self-efficacy associated with poor outcomes. So we want to again, in our pain treatments, teach people to stop catastrophizing um, or morph negative these thoughts into more positive ones and boost their self-efficacy. That's solid. Um, and on average, teaching people to be mindful um, is associated with doing a little better. So there's a direct positive benefit. But the importance and role of mindfulness is more nuanced than just being a little bit better. It does not buffer or reduce the association between catastrophizing and poor outcomes. And instead, um, um, well, instead it seems to make things worse. So to kind of summarize, one way to think about this is that if you think of mindfulness as letting a thought kind of float down the stream, and you're relaxed and you just accept that thought, when that thought is positive, let it go and let it do its, all its good work downstream, perhaps unconsciously. But when that thought is bad, it may not be a good idea to accept it and just let it go. Maybe it's a good idea to get some judgment in there. Um, so a toxic thought that you let go down the stream might just be doing some poisoning. Um, mindfulness is good on average, but it might not be good in every context and for every person. And this got us to thinking. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we're, where we're going with some of this, but to, to we keep in mind that only 13% of, uh, of, uh, of the interactions were significant, although everyone was in the opposite predicted. The interaction effects were weak, cross-sectional design, so we cannot um, conclude causality. I think this is more like a gauntlet that was thrown um, that we need to, uh, to look at this more. But they do call into question the relative importance of mindfulness. Um, and they call into question the buffering mold mindfulness may have. So maybe there are people that we shouldn't be teaching to be mindful. <laughs> um, maybe we should start thinking about precision cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and not stop thinking about, well, this is effective on average, let's just give it to everybody. Maybe there are people that we should give these different therapies to. So a new direction for us is to look for contextual factors and moderators that influence the benefit of our different treatments to improve patient treatment matching. Um, we're looking at a model that we call the Limit Activate Enhance model in which we look at that some treatments are there to limit bad stuff, so stop doing that. And the people that might benefit most from that are the people that are doing that. Stop catastrophizing, high catastrophizers may be the ones that benefit from that. There are treatments that activate adaptive responses, coping responses, operant therapy, and the people that may benefit from that may be those who lack adaptive responses. And then there are treatments that are there to enhance or make use of a person's individual strengths. So maybe somebody who's more mindful in general would benefit from mindfulness training, Someone more hypnotizable would benefit more from hypnosis um, and the slow wave oscillations that are associated with that. So uh, we did some, some analyses um, to start to look at that. This is a, a trial that's just been completed. A group of patients with chronic pain randomly assigned to cognitive therapy. Hypnosis focused on pain reduction. Hypnotic cognitive therapy using hypnosis to change thoughts and an education control. And um, we're in the middle of analyses for this study, but I'm gonna present baseline outcome, baseline data predicting outcome. And what we found was that predictors of outcome involved um, a hypnotizability and these alpha slow wave oscillations. Alpha oscillations, as you know, are those that help the brain stay calm. And as it turns out, and as predicted, Patients or individuals who are more hypnotizable responded more to the hypnosis interventions. But those who were more hypnotizable and those who had more alpha at baseline did not do so well with cognitive therapy. So alpha oscillations in particular predicted who would do well with each treatment. 
Um, and these are moderate, uh, moderate to strong associations. So for example, um, overall, if you look at everybody in general, both cognitive therapy and hypnotic cognitive therapy uh, resulted in pain reduction. But if you match people to treatment based on alpha oscillations, those who, get, who had low alpha did better with cognitive therapy than those who did had high alpha. And those who had more alpha did better with hypnosis than those who had less alpha. So the brains of the patients at, brain activity at baseline predicted who would respond to which treatment. And pretty substantially, um, you want to match people to different treatments. We're, tr doing a, a, we're just starting a trial right now um, to look at a large group of patients who with uh, low back pain or perhaps chronic pain, we're, we're discussing that, and they're getting three treatments um, randomly. Cognitive therapy to change content, mindfulness meditation to change process, and behavioral activation to change behavior. And the question is, um, which of these, content, process, or activity level, is more important to outcome? And more importantly, we're going to look at who responds to each of these based on our limit activate model. So what we're, we're heading towards is precision uh, cognitive therapy rather than, ah, oh, this is beneficial on average, let's give everybody this. So that's it. Um, for the primary analysis I presented, I want to thank uh, collaborators Beverly Thorne, James Carmody, Frank Keefe, and John Burns. John Burns is the PI on the clinical trial that those data came from. For the um, power pop study where we looked at alpha waves, I want to thank my uh, collaborators of that at the University of Washington. And for the project that's just getting started, thank the collaborators on, on that. And of course, thank the National Institute of Health, um, NCCMRR, for uh, the trial for the uh, alpha study, and um, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which now has a new name, <laughs> um, for the other studies. So. Thank you very, very, very much. Five minutes for questions? Comments uh, for five minutes? Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for that presentation. It was really interesting. I think it's really important to grapple with unexpected results, uh, as you have done. Um, one of my questions is really uh, about those initial findings. Those were based on your baseline measures, right? Um, so my question is, were those individuals just not good at the process part right. yet? Right. And did you check to see if you got similar results at the end of that intervention where maybe they had improved in yeah. process yeah. as opposed to just content? Yep. Excellent question, and that study is still ongoing. Um, so the data are not yet cleaned and locked, but we will certainly ask that question. Um, it's, uh, it, before you're trained in mindfulness, you just may not do it that well. And what you re how you respond to the questionnaire is maybe related to, you know, once you're trained up and know how to do it, then maybe it'll buffer the effects and, and benefit the effects. So we will definitely look at that. Because um, this, th this was more like... We expect this result, and boom, it didn't happen. So it's more, the gauntlet is now thrown. Now I think we have to go back and say, is mindfulness all that it's cracked up to be? It may be, um, but then it may not be. Oh, I didn't present findings from a other study that was, that was done, uh, which used um, uh, baseline uh, brain waves to predict response to mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And in fact, if you had more alpha, you didn't do so well with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy relative to high alpha. So that finding was replicated. Hi, uh, Jim Griffin, NICHD. Again, thank you. Great presentation, very thought-provoking. I guess if you could reflect a little bit, though, on the origins of where mindfulness training comes from there about Buddhism, because it seems to me by definition, you know, First arrow is the pain, the second arrow is how you react to the pain. And if you catastrophize, it's almost a sign that you really aren't being very mindful because you're, that's what you're focusing on is the reaction. So it, 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 I mean, and a lot of people are going a lot of debates about secular mindfulness training versus if you just take it out of the roots, the philosophical roots of Buddhism, 
do you get the same thing? And right. some people argue very, very strongly no. So if you could just discuss, think about that, or what your reflections on it. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, the, the way that I think of content um, is that, in fact, most of, of, of what goes through our mind catastrophizing, et cetera, is also not being mindful. Um, that, that these automatic thoughts are just running in the background. Um, so I think that, that, uh, that, that if you train people to be mindful in certain ways, for example, be aware of your thoughts, and then maybe make a, dis a mindful decision about what to do with them, ah, that one I'm going to let go because it's helpful and useful, and maybe I want to nurture it and focus on it, and then step back and make a judgment. You know, that one's not so good, so I'm actually going to make some effort to, to, to make a change. And so that's where I think going back to kind of traditional cognitive therapy may be most useful. It, when our head is filled with these negative thoughts, I'm a horrible person, then that's the time to do cognitive therapy. The time to do mindfulness, these data suggest, and I think may be true, is that when our head is filled with fruits and vegetables. We go, you know what? I'm just going to focus on those and let them go and maybe even nurture them a little bit. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jensen, for your excellent talk. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Mauricio Delgado. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this fantastic symposium. It's truly an honor to be here and be able to share with you some of the recent work that we've been doing in our lab on how reflecting on the positive past can affect decision making and uh, responses to stress. And I'd like to start with uh, a simple yet perhaps obvious observation that stress is ubiquitous in our lives. And if left unregulated, it can have significant consequences to our well being. In fact, research has shown that even uh, daily stressors like work-related problems can elicit negative emotional reactions that predict uh, psychological distress and chronic issues in the future. Further, this negative affect elicited from stress can also promote maladaptive decision-making, such as drug-seeking, uh, in part to alleviate these effects of stress. And this basically underscores the importance and significance of understanding the mechanisms underlying successful emotion regulation. Now, a common way to, um, to try to cope with negative emotions is to apply uh, cognitive strategies that try to change the way we feel by changing the way we think. And a common method that's used throughout the cognitive neuroscience literature is the strategy of reappraisal, where one tries to reinterpret the meaning of a stimulus that typically causes the negative reactions to try to change the emotional responses elicited by that stimulus. And one, uh, one influential study in cognitive neuroscience by Kevin Oxner and colleagues uh, was when participants were actually viewing negative or aversive pictures in the MRI scanner while uh, assessing whether these pictures were truly aversive or not. And they would look at a picture such as a burning building, and they would attend to their natural feelings, and you'd see basically that they, this would elicit negative reactions and also responses in brain centers such as the amygdala that are involved in emotional responding. But then when they were asked to regulate their emotions or regulate that picture, they basically would try to detach themselves from the situation or reinterpret the meaning of the stimulus, and this would result in decreases in subjective feelings of emotion, as well as these uh, neurocenters involved in responding to these aversive stimuli. Similarly, you can see uh, changes to different types of stimulus, such as uh, drug-related stimuli. Here's a picture of a cigarette. When smokers were presented with this, this is work by Heidi Koper, you'd see that participants are craving the cigarettes when they're asked to attend to it, but once they're asked to apply an emotion regulation strategy such as reappraisal and think about the long-term consequences, perhaps, of smoking, then you might see a decrease in craving responses. And while these uh, uh, reappraisal strategies are useful and important in a variety of stimulus, what we often see is that they're not as effective for everyone or in all contexts, as Dr. Jensen just highlighted for also mindfulness. Uh, one particular reason might be because uh, it can be difficult to apply these types of strategies. They tend to recruit more effortful cognitive control processes, 
and are not as uh, easily processed for everyone. Further, with respect to particular context, uh, they're really not as effective under stress. And in fact, sometimes it can lead to increases in uh, peak activity or reactivity of the stress hormone cortisol, particularly in response to social or physical stressors. So in the lab, what we've been doing more recently is trying to think about alternative strategies that may help regulate emotions. And in particular, we've been focused on positive emotion. And this has uh, roots in the uh, broad and build theory of positive emotion that suggests that savoring positive emotions can impact greater well-being by broadening one's cognitive perspectives and helping build psychological resources for coping. And the way we uh, do this in the lab is we essentially ask participants to remember the good times. Okay, so we, have, um, we take advantage of the fact that the retrieval of autobiographical memories tends to bring back emotions tied to your original experience. And we also take advantage of the fact that autobiographical memories have this adaptive role which helps bolster a sense of self-identity and helps shape future perspective planning, therefore helping uh, influence an individual's well-being. And we argue, therefore, that recalling positive uh, memories can cultivate these um, emotions and tends to be intrinsically valuable to an individual. So we hypothesize that essentially being able to savor these positive memories will have a positive effect on one's well-being and increase subjective feelings and also will be dependent on neural circuits involved in reward processing. Now, what I'm putting up here is a uh, meta-analysis of about 500 or so studies that have investigated in the brain uh, processes related to reward, and I'm going to focus particularly in the circuitry and looking at areas of the brain such as the striatum and prefrontal cortex. They are commonly activated across all these studies uh, with different types of rewards and in different types of experimental paradigms. So we hypothesize that we'll also see the circuits being activated by merely recalling positive memories, and that they will be associated then with increases in well-being. Further, uh, we hypothesize since, since that we are thinking that positive memories may serve as an alternative form of emotion regulation, that we'll see adaptive influences on individuals' responses to stress, as well as decision-making. And beyond being uh, reliant on these neural circuits involved in reward and decision-making, we'll also see uh, some involvement of regions of the brain involved in cognitive control and more specifically emotion regulation strategies. So this is a different meta-analysis of studies of cognitive reappraisal that focus on areas of the brain such as the dorsal lateral and the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. So let me tell you how we go about doing this in the lab. And I'm going to first tell you that this is work done by a great graduate student, Meg Spear, who has really spearheaded a lot of the year work in the lab. So we have participants come into the lab and they basically do a uh, positive memory recall paradigm. The first session, they receive a questionnaire, and the questionnaire contains several cues, several uh, mini sentences, and they have to provide a brief description of a memory that they were personally involved in and, and tell us a little bit more about the memory, how it makes them feel. So, for example, you may see um, a cue such as playing in the snow, and this might conjure up a memory of when you were a kid that you were building the snowman of your friends, and then you, uh, after you write us the details about this memory, you then rate it in terms of how positive it made it feel to relive this experience, uh, how intense was it, uh, basically how vivid, so on and so forth. Now, I like to put this example up because it allows me the chance to also tell you that when I see playing in the snow, it's quite a negative memory. It just thinks, I think of shoveling and things like this. And so this might cue different memories for different people. So there's certainly a lot of subjective variability here. And we ask people to really focus on more of the positive experience and the positive memories. And if something is not so, just skip it and go to the next cue. The other thing I like to point out is that as you're going through different cues, you might come up with a cue like this. Go ahead. Think of a positive memory for grocery shopping. <laughs> I once saved $3 buying cereal. Right? So you might have memories here, but they may not have as positive content as some other ones. And that's okay. This is part of the design. We wanted to have a variety of memories that would allow us to then compare memories that elicit positive feelings versus memory that are more neutral in content, but yet engage in memory mechanisms. So therefore, what I'm showing you here at this data is that we have a, a memories that elicit positive, memories that elicit neutral feelings, and then we're going to compare them as people recalling them in the MRI scanner. So we ask people to come back about three days later. We put them in the scanner, and they're recalling these memories. And what we observe is activity in these reward centers of the brain. I, what I'm showing you here is activity in the caudate part of the striatum as they are reminiscing about the positive past. 
And strikingly, what's pretty interesting here is if you look at this brain activity, it parametrically varies as a function of how, uh, positive, how much positive emotion one felt upon reliving these memories. The, the greater the uh, feeling elicited, the greater engagement of these reward centers. Another interesting thing is if you've ever been in an MRI scanner, you get out of the MRI scanner and you're very relieved to get out of the scanner. And over here, we measured mood before and after the experiment, and we actually saw people increase mood after participants uh, participated in this task, which is interesting and also correlated with these uh, reward system uh, activation. So there's a change in mood as a function of recalling positive memories. And finally, it also correlated with individual measures of resiliency. Uh, this is measured by a questionnaire, the Connor Davidson questionnaire. So the more, again, you recruit these reward systems, uh, perhaps the more resilient you are as an individual, which allows us to then ask the question whether we can use these positive memory strategies or recall positive memories as a way to regulate our emotions. So in a follow-up study, again, uh, led, efforts led by Meg Spear, uh, we actually had participants come to the lab and we exposed them to an acute stressor. Specifically, we used the socially evaluated cold pressure test where you put your hands in cold water while there's a camera basically right in front of you and, and studying your facial expressions. Now, this is quite an a intense stressor, and we, you can see spike, spikes in not only the subjective measures of stress, but also physiological measures of stress via, via cortisol. So we acquire salivatory cortisol at baseline before the stressor, 20 minutes later when the cortisol peaks, and then 15 minutes, 15 minutes later during recovery. The critical aspect of the manipulation here, though, is that right after exposure to stress, we ask participants to either recall positive memories or, in a different group, recall neutral memories. Okay? And we compare what is the effect of stress uh, after these recall. So what I'm showing you here in the y-axis is the uh, cortisol response, and then in the x-axis is the three time points at which you collected cortisol. And I'm going to first show you the typical stress response that you might see and this is the group that underwent stress exposure and then recalled neutral memories. And you see that uh, cortisol rises and slowly comes back down to baseline. In contrast, the group of interest is the group that underwent stress exposure and then recalled positive memories. And what we see here is a significant dampening of the physiological reactivity to stress. In fact, it's pretty much the same as the control group that never underwent stress to begin with. So this was uh, pretty interesting and supportive of the idea that positive memories can help uh, cope with some aspects of stress. We replicated these findings in the MRI scanner, and we also replicated the uh, recruitment of reward-related regions. But further, we found some, another uh, interesting aspect of this data, which was that basically uh, participants were also engaging more emotion regulation-related regions, and there is a stronger connectivity between areas such as the ventral lateral and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex as a function of increased positive feelings. The more, the stronger the positive emotion in these trials, the more connectivity to these emotion regulation areas that helped uh, curtail the stress response. Okay. So far, what I've told you about is that recalling positive experiences from the past can help increase positive emotions, can help influence mood, and this tends to be dependent on variations in the reward-related neurocircuitry. Further, these positive memories may serve as an alternative form of emotion regulation because they tend to dampen the physiological response to acute stress and may rely on neurocircuitry potentially involved in emotion regulatory processes. Now, one of the things we were interested in is uh, to follow this up was to actually understand how these positive memories would then work with subsequent decision making. And specifically, we wanted to ask the question whether recalling positive memories would uh, help regulate your emotions to the point of actually making you make good choices, perhaps choosing a more um, delayed versus an immediate reward. Okay? So this idea of um, temporal discounting is an interesting one because it, it shows that there's a preference for, in, participants sometimes tend to have a preference for immediate compared to delayed rewards, even if the delayed reward confers greater long-term benefits. And this uh, temporal discounting tends to be a failure of self-control that's nicely illustrated in this example by Walter and Michelle and the classic marshmallow test, where the child is presented with a marshmallow now, or you wait and you can get two marshmallows later. Now, 
Uh, excessive temporal discounting has been linked to several clinical issues and behavioral issues, and certainly, uh, particularly for us, we were interested in terms of the implications for addictive behaviors. Additionally, there are several manipulations that have attempted to look at impulsivity and intertemporal choices in the lab. One of the ones that has been somewhat effective is positive perspection, or thinking or imagining the future uh, in a positive way sometimes has a good effect on discounting and tends to reduce discounting. We hypothesize that since imagining the future and reflecting on the past can share similar neurocircuitry in terms of autobiographical memories, that perhaps we might see similar effects by using uh, this positive memory recall strategy. So this study here that was done with, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Phelps at NYU, and it was led by Carolina Lampert, who is now at UPenn, who did a great job with this study. Uh, basically, we had participants do the same questionnaire that I described before, where they do positive and neutral memories, and then three days later, they come back and we selected some of the more positive memories. And we presented them with that trial. So for example, in a memory trial, you'd see the cue playing in the snow, and you would ask to reflect on that memory and think about it. Then you would, uh, again, rate it in terms of the feelings that it evoked, and so on and so forth. But the key manipulation here is that after reflecting in that memory, now participants were faced with a series of choices, about six or so choices that between either a small uh, reward, immediate reward, or a larger delayed reward, such as $10 today, or $20 in a week. The magnitude of the delayed reward varied uh, up to like $50 or $60, and the magnitude of the delayed varied up to six months, actually. And what we classified here is try to understand what did participants do? Were they more, did they choose the immediate reward more or the delayed reward more? And we try to, to, to calculate the discount rate for each uh, question and each trial in a memory trial and compared it with a control trial where participants basically just relaxed instead of reminiscing about any memories, and then performed the same type of choices. So the choices here were fit to a hyperbolic model, and we acquired this discount rate for individual participants, and just compared if participants were more impulsive or more patient when recalling positive memories versus uh, control. So the simple question is whether retrieval of positive memories would lead to more patients. If indeed was positive memories can uh, be more emotion regulatory, then it might actually relate to, to these behaviors. And the simple answer is yes, but let me break down the, the trial, the graph here a little bit. The discount rate uh, tends to be a measure of impulsivity. The greater the discount rate, the more impulsive a person is. And over here, I have discount rate on the left, on the y-axis, and subjects are the individual bars in this graph. And you can see here is if you take a difference between control, discount rate and control versus the memory, we see more patients when remembering, which is graphed by the blue bars, and, and, um, and this tends to be significant. We did a control condition where we actually had participants think about negative memories to see if it was just an effect of memory as opposed to uh, positivity into the memories, and that, would, that did not work out. So essentially, it's thinking about negative memories uh, did not change any decision making. So this really was attributed to positive memories. When we replicated the study in the scanner, we also looked at brain correlates of this, and we found that the striatum, once again, was active when participants were reminiscing about the positive past. And this time, it predicted patient behavior. So the more you engage the striatum, the more you um, were able to decrease the activity, or decrease the impulsive behavior. Further, now we also observed activity in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex during both choice and uh, reminiscent behavior and the similarity across, uh, similarity across these, this area between both periods also tended to predict the behavior effect. Okay, so what I've shown you here is that the recalling positive experience from the past reduces temporal discounting, promotes patient behavior, and tends to engage this reward-related neurocircuitry. Uh, currently, there's some replication efforts trying to be done with distinct types of positive emotion strategies, such as nostalgia and gratitude in different populations and older adults. This is work done by Carolina Lampert at UPenn, and she's, she's in the midst of this. And in our lab, we've been trying to focus a little bit more on what are the mechanisms that may underlie the benefits of this positive memory recall. And we've been thinking about specifically the fact that each, um, some of the more treasured memories that we have tend to involve other people so that there's a social context uh, inherent in these autobiographical memories that becomes important. And to just give you a quick peek on this, if I was to compare 
uh, instead of positive versus neutral memory, if I was to go and compare social versus non-social memories, such as playing in the snow versus receiving a good grade, which is as positive of a memory and elicits the same feelings, yet the difference here is between social versus non-social, we see a big difference in these reward centers of the brain, which are showing greater responses to the more social than the non-social memories. Further, if I was to reclassify memories uh, in terms of how close somebody is to, to, to uh, this increased social context in the memories, we can see that uh, in terms of cortisol, that the greater the social context inherent in the memory, the greater the decrease in the cortisol response in our stress sample, suggesting that positive memories high in social context can be associated with increased activity in these reward centers and reduction in cortisol response after acute stress, and they may be a potential modulator of the positive memory benefits. So taken together, uh, I'll try to show you today is that reflect on the positive past and cultivating positive emotions via this strategy can have beneficial effects on well-being, helping one cope with acute stress response and promoting more patient decision-making. And I'd like to thank the, uh, my lab who did this work, specifically the work by Megan Spear and collaborators such as Carolina Lampert at UPenn and, and uh, generous funding by NIMH and IDA to help support these studies. And thank you for your attention today. Thank you, uh, Mauricio, for, for such a great, a great talk. So I was wondering, what would happen if the positive uh, memory uh, is about behavior that's not uh, necessarily healthy, right? So I came into your lab, right, and I took the, the questionnaire, and I have a positive memory when I went out with my friends uh, and we drank, we, we listened to music, we danced, and we drank some more, and we smoked cigarettes or whatever, and that's so positive, you know. So, I mean, is, have you come across subjects with those positive memories? And yeah, I think this is, this is a great question, a problem we're tackling right now. For now, we focused on the, the idea of people tend to be very nostalgic when they think about these positive memories. They think of trips when they were kids. They think of family members and, and times to get together. There may be an example here or there where people say, well, I was out of my friends drinking. One of the things that we're attempting to do right now is if we can isolate or focus on some of these memories that maybe are lead to unhealthy behaviors, can we highlight the healthy portions of the behaviors within that memory? And maybe the next time they recall it, what's going to come up to become more positive is the healthy behavior as opposed to the unhealthy one. And over time, we hope to promote some kind of change to it. But it's an ongoing progress. Good, great question. Hi, great talk. I'm wondering uh, what the role of activating the self in some way with your, with your induction, because essentially you're in a lot of ways just inducing positive affect, and we can induce positive affect by watching like a comedy clip, right? Mm -hmm. So um, do, and you know, especially when you talked about the role of kind of your social self um, in, in your induction, have you considered comparing a positive autobiographical induction with a regular induction and seeing if you get similar effects? Yeah, fantastic question. I left, uh, I left out this piece of data for time reasons, but we have, in, across the experiments, we have a control condition where we induce positive affect, we doubt the self condition, uh, just to see if it's just a positive affect manipulation. And the way we do this sometimes is we take the IAPS pictures that are positively induced, we actually ask people to reimagine those situations, like think of a baby uh, cooing or something, or think of a puppy saying hi, and as long as you don't keep it about yourself, and they generate positive feelings, but they don't elicit the same effect. In fact, they, they, they don't affect decision making. They actually make you more impulsive in a way. And they, um, they're less valuable than the reward, the, the positive memories, or recalling the positive memories that we do in a willingness to pay type of task. So uh, we, there's a big component of the self aspect to this, bolstering the sense of self identity. Uh, one more question. I, th I think you were up first. So, um, Two, well, two very brief questions. One is that, was there a dose-response relationship? The more positive the memory, the more dampening of the stress response. 
And the other is, in addition <clears throat> to positive and negative, excuse me, there's the salience mm -hmm. and the quality of the memory. So some memories may be more vague, other may be much more cl clear. Does that affect the response? Great. So uh, the first question about the dose dependent of the response, uh, yes, so there's, <laughs> there's a relationship, especially in the stress study, that the, the more positivity is related to greater increases in mood, which leads to a better effect. Uh, it's not consistent across all the studies, which could be a sample size issue, but for the most part, I think the greater feeling in association with the reward system, the better the, uh, the effect. The um, second part of the question was about negative memories. In Just the um, salience, like how clear the memory oh, is. Oh, that's right. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the level of the details, the richness of the memory does have an impact. Uh, we are now doing more explicit tests of this and actually having people write down their memories and checking out the content to see how rich they are in content and how positive it is in content. So then the next time they recall it, does, does, does the content change in terms of being more positive when, you, when we focus on that as opposed to more negative? So the richness does matter. We just don't have clear data yet to, to highlight this. Thank you. Another fascinating talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Delgado. Thank you. And for our final speaker on this panel, we're excited to welcome Dr. Elliot, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Elliot Berkman. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about cognitive training today, uh, but I wanted to first zoom out a little bit and, and give you kind of the, the big picture in my lab, um, which studies behavior change and particularly health behavior change. So what I mean in, in that sense is behaviors such as cigarette smoking, unhealthy eating, lack of, lack of physical activity. So in our view, there's really two things, and, and this isn't quite a theory, it's more just a way of organizing the world um, or the research world, which is to think about um, behavior change having these two essential components. So one being motivational processes um, and, and reward motivation in particular. So that, I think, some of what Maurizio was just talking about in terms of social motivation or self-identity self would fall into that. So we call that the will. Um, and then the other side of it is the, the kind of cognitive, executive, knowledge, skills, capacities, abilities. That's the way. So you need to both want to do something and also know how to do it. Um, and so the, the kind of confluence of those things is where behavior change happens. So I, this, I'm, I'm saying this just to kind of make, make it absolutely clear that when I talk about cognitive training, a lot of the studies that we've conducted and that, and that other people conduct kind of assume, sometimes test, but usually just assume that the people in the studies want to change. Um, and so that, that's kind of one sort of area that I'll just you know, flag for you to kind of watch out for in the literature. Um, so in, in terms of the cognitive factors, which will be my focus today, what I'm talking about are skills, knowledge, capacities. And so I know, you know, as NIH scientists, we're, we're completely you know, familiar with these kinds of interventions. Often it's psychoeducation or skills building, something like that. Um, and in this case, you know, I'll say they're clearly a prerequisite for health behavior change. They're not the only thing, but they're certainly a necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on one specific type of cognitive skill, which is uh, response inhibition or inhibitory control. Um, and I focus on that because it's thought to underlie or be kind of an important component process for many, for behavior change in many uh, behaviors of interest. So cigarette smoking cessation, for example, I think is a really good model um, to think about, you know, how do you go about quitting? Well, the challenge of quitting, um, we know, is, is craving, right? Urges to smoke. And one way to deal with, and, and of course, this is not just true for cigarettes, right? There's many kinds of unhealthy behaviors that are often preceded by, presumably caused by, uh, these urges to consume the drug, the, the, you know, the alcohol, the food. Um, and so one way of dealing with them would be to try to inhibit that urge. Uh, so not totally dissimilar from emotion regulation, as Maurizio mentioned. So we have a capacity to change the way that we think about emotions. We can also change the way that we think about urges or cravings um, to reduce them. 
So in this uh, kind of framework, we think about inhibitory control as this kind of underlying cognitive capacity that might, might help people or might promote uh, health behaviors such as cigarette cessation, which is what I'll focus on today. Um, and we also know quite a bit about the mechanisms now from basic research in cognitive neuroscience of exactly, you know, on a fairly fine-grained level, how inhibitory control works from, you know, really nice, uh, psychometrically sound laboratory paradigms. Um, and so we can kind of identify the brain regions and, and in similar ways that you just heard about uh, from Maurizio, we can sort of identify using the you know, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, as kind of a marker, as an index of the degree to which uh, people are recruiting these brain regions that are fairly well established to be involved in inhibitory control. So in this first study, um, what I wanted to, to test was, was really kind of an initial, um, I think of it as a sanity check, um, to say, okay, you know, these brain regions are presumably involved in inhibitory control. We really only know that from these basic laboratory tasks of people inhibiting button presses um, but we first wanted to make sure that that actually mapped onto ecologically valid behaviors in the real world that we, we care about. Um, it, that hadn't really been done. Um, and so the first kind of stab at this was just a, a small study of community uh, cigarette smokers who enrolled in a quitting program. So these people had demonstrated motive and, in fact, behavior engaging you know, cessation. So they, they did want to quit. Um, and so the, the overall design of this study capitalized on the fact that many cessation programs, including uh, this one, this is the uh, um, uh, freedom, freedom from tobacco, or sorry, freedom from quitting, or freedom from smoking program, there's a bunch of them, um, where you, the, it's an eight-week group-based program, and, the, and you, you, know, you pick a quit date before, uh, in the initial session, but you get a couple of weeks where people are kind of ad-lib smoking, um, and then, so we know when their quit date is. Um, it's ahead of that. So we can scan them. We can use uh, fMRI to look at their brain activity before they are in acute withdrawal. Um, and then we can monitor their behavior, um, looking at you know, how, how much they're smoking and look at um, ex exhaled carbon monoxide as an index of that. Um, and so the design, the approach here was to actually measure brain activity before, um, and we're using brain activity in this case as, as our independent variable. This is our predictor. Um, in some ways, we, we know um, that inhibitory control will recruit these regions. That wasn't really the question. The question here was, to what extent does this activity go on to then kind of prospectively predict uh, cessation outcomes in the real world? So we, we looked at uh, brain activity in these areas. Um, and then our operationalization of craving was this uh, a time-lagged relationship between craving, which precedes smoking typically, um, and then smoking. So this would be kind of a, a typical day in, in the life of one smoker. And you can see their craving levels sort of vary across time throughout that day. Um, and then their smoking also varies. And so what we were looking at was this, you know, okay, I, I asked you at, you know, 8 a.m. How, how much you were craving a cigarette. And then I'm going to signal you again at 10 a.m. and ask you, you know, in the previous two hours, have you smoked a cigarette? How many cigarettes have you had? Um, and that time-lagged relationship um, became our, our index of, of kind of in vivo craving regulation. How good are you at tamping down or essentially breaking the link between craving and smoking? Um, and so that was what we thought really a priori. We said, okay, this is the, the index here that ought to be correlated with um, what cognitive neuroscientists have, have identified as inhibitory control. So that was our essential question here. Um, and as it turns out, um, it, it mapped on fairly nicely. So people that did not engage inferior frontal gyrus, so that's one of those uh, three brain regions that I showed you, but I'll, I'll also just note that all three brain regions showed this same pattern, um, that people who didn't engage showed this pretty much positive relationship between cravings and smoking. You know, the more you, you craved cigarettes, the more you were likely to smoke them subsequently. Um, but for people who had moderate or low levels, or sorry, moderate or high levels of activity in the brain region at baseline during inhibitory control, they showed a significantly um, lower relationship, in fact, not significantly different from, from zero. So essentially for these folks, their, their smoking, their craving were, were decoupled. 
um, which is pretty interesting and, and for us supportive evidence that this was a useful index of inhibitory control in the world. So um, to some, maybe greater activation in these regions related to better uh, regulation during the quit attempt. Um, and our next question to follow up on this, which was in some ways kind of a, a moonshot, we realized, um, but we wondered if, if there was a way, you know, if these putative kind of mechanisms of inhibitory control uh, could be modulated directly through um, brain training. Um, and so when we planned the study, which was back in 2011, um, brain training was still sort of a hot topic, and people thought it held a lot of promise. Um, so I'll, I'll just foreshadow that. Uh, it made sense at the time. And what we thought was, you know, okay, this is, it's a kind of an interesting model for translational research also, which I'll mention, which is that we're testing a process, but we're also doing it within the context of an RCT, right? The RCT is going to both uh, give us kind of preliminary evidence of, of what might eventually look like an intervention, but it will also really let us test this causal relationship between the mechanisms of brain activity and uh, behavioral outcomes. Um, so what we did this, uh, what we did to test this idea was we brought in a group of people uh, who self-reported. It was fairly, a, pretty much a convenient sample, but these folks did self-report having problems with self-control. Um, and so we brought them in. We gave them a series of tasks related to self-control, including uh, the stop signal task, which I'll tell you about uh, in a bit. Then they were randomly assigned to receive cognitive inhibitory control training, uh, where they pretty much practice this task over time. Um, we use the stop signal because it's adaptive, which is one of the features that, that people think leads to a more efficacious cognitive training. Um, and then a control group also kind of came, so it was an active control that came into the lab and also completed a computerized task that just didn't involve stopping. Um, and then the endpoint, we scanned them again um, just to look at change in the task. And we also have some follow-up data the, the task itself is quite simple. Um, it's not too dissimilar from a go-no-go, -no -go, um, which you may be familiar with, but essentially there's a cue that tells you a trial is about to start, um, and then you get a go stimulus, so it's an arrow pointing to the left or right, and so your, your first job is to press the button, the right or left button, as quickly as you can, um, as soon as you see the arrow. Um, but annoyingly, um, occasionally there's a stop trial, so shortly after the go arrow appears, um, you'll hear this beep uh, through the headphones. The beep serves as the stop signal, and that tells you, oh, wait, just kidding. Don't press the button on this trial um, as, as fast as you can. And the adaptive component is this um, so-called stop signal delay, which we vary uh, in a systematic way so that participants are successful on 50% of the trial. So um, this is either an inhibitory control task or a frustration induction depending on how you look at it. Um, but it is, it's nice for training because as people get better, the idea is the stop signal delay can grow, um, that you can have more time between when you start you know, your, your kind of go process and then when the beep appears and it tells you to stop. Um, you can have more time uh, and still successfully stop, which you know, in the models underlying these things, kind of indicates well, you're, what that means is your stopping process is becoming more efficient, that you can have you know, even less time to kind of slam on the brakes and still successfully stop. So you can divide this task into a kind of more proactive phase that happens early before the acute inhibition is required, um, and a reactive phase um, when the kind of slamming on the brakes actually happens. And I'll present um, analyses of what's happening in people's brains at these two different phases of time. Um, were, were people able to improve on the task behaviorally? Um, the answer is yes. So before training, the two groups uh, reassuringly performed about equally. Um, and the dependent measure here is, is the stop signal response time. So it is kind of in response time units. Um, and so uh, smaller numbers, you know, shorter bars means better stopping. And what we find is the training group uh, did improve to a greater degree than the control group. You still get a little improvement in the control group, which is essentially a practice effect, because this is the second time they're doing it now. Um, in terms of the reactive phase, which is where you typically will find the stopping network active in the brain, um, we saw increases in really just one 
one of the nodes of the stopping network, this kind of uh, basal ganglia, you know, part of the motor control circuit, which is not surprising, but what was odd to us was, hey, what happened to that prefrontal stuff? There was, you know, ACC, and there was lateral prefrontal, which are often, you know, typical sort of top-down control or goal representation areas. They um, were not only did not increase over time during this phase, but in fact, they decreased in their activity across time, uh, which was puzzling. We thought, okay, maybe, you know, maybe there's sort of an efficiency story here. I mean, this is one of the limitations of fMRI, right? It's, it's totally ambiguous as to exactly what's going on. All we can really say is that, you know, there's less activation in these areas during actual stopping um, after training um, to a greater extent in the training group compared to the control group. So uh, we shifted to the proactive phase um, and observed that, in fact, they kind of popped up there um, in terms of increases. So, so what's really happened is these lateral prefrontal regions, the ones within the stopping network that are particularly involved with goal representation and kind of planning and foresight, have shifted their activity in time. Um, they've come on earlier. Uh, this is consistent with the dual uh, mechanisms of control model that Todd Braver has put forward, um, sort of suggesting that you can, once you learn the particulars of a task, you can engage control in a slightly different way that can be more efficient. Sort of like you know, starting to slow your car down when the light turns yellow as opposed to when it turns red and slamming on the brakes. So people are getting more efficient. Um, and, and this efficiency uh, was actually linked to... Uh, both other brain regions, so the, the greater uh, people shifted in time um, from the later kind of reactive phase to the earlier proactive phase, uh, the, the greater increases we saw in the motor control network, um, and the greater their, their kind of decrements in the stop signal time. So all these things are consistent in telling the story that this proactive shift um, is functional and it's helping people get better. Um, so this is what we're calling the proactive shift. Um, but pushing it kind of in a translational direction, um, this became a bit of a challenge because what, what it indicated to us, and again, what's consistent with the dual mechanism of, of control model, um, is that people are getting better at this task because they're learning this, the particulars. They're learning how, you know, what are the events, what are the signals, what are the cues that predict the need to stop, um, which is a really rational thing to do um, but it, you can imagine, really restricts generalizability. Because if I am getting better at this task only because I've learned the signals that predict stopping on this task, then what that means is that when I try to recruit inhibitory control in a very different context, like I'm trying to quit smoking now or I'm trying to change my diet now, um, the cues that would signal to me that I need to engage inhibitory control in those contexts are, are completely different, right? And this training would not generalize at all. Um, which, which really is the challenge, and it's what we started to see and what started to emerge within the cognitive training literature, uh, you know, lamentably, a few years after we started the study. Um, this study, I, you know, I want to know, is kind of one of many studies out there in the literature that's finding this, that you, you can train people to improve an inhibitory control on a given task, um, but, but often that training doesn't endure. And importantly, the training doesn't generalize to other tasks, which is the real challenge. Um, we weren't quite ready to give up on this yet, um, and so the way we approached it was to fall back on that same kind of cue learning paradigm, essentially, and say, well, okay, if the issue is people are learning the cues of the task, then what we ought to do is embed real-world, ecologically valid cues into the training, um, and that might help people, you know, generalize. So in the next study, uh, this one was funded by NIA, uh, we used a larger sample. We uh, engaged personalized risk cues. So part of the study, we built a database of 23,000 images of uh, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, and food. And each participant got to choose her or his own, you know, what we call sin stim, your customized set of cues that, that you have trouble inhibiting. So, you know, for me, this might be beer and pizza. Um, and it might be other people. Thank you. Um, so what we found uh, was that the tr in this condition, we had similar training effects, but they were, you know, much weaker. Um, sorry, I'm going to kind of go a little quickly. Um, and similarly, we, we moved to a slightly younger age bracket. 
uh, adolescents. And in adolescents, we use different uh, risk cues. In this case, these were not substance using adolescents. So for adolescents, we know, you know the peer influence, the peer environment can be a risk cue. So we use peer uh, faces. And again, similar findings, there was improvement um, that was uh, sort of moderate, modest. Um, and interestingly, it correlated with adverse childhood experiences as measured with this ACEs questionnaire. Um, so what the kind of summary of this line of work is that, yes, there's, you know, there's evidence of this proactive shift. Um, you can get it to generalize slightly in other contexts, but, but it, in general, the, um, any deviations from a very clean kind of you know, clean sample that's subclinical um, and really highly functioning can severely reduce the effect, sharply reduce the effect. Um, which is unfortunate because that's, you know, the populations who would need inhibitory control training the most or the contexts where you would want to deliver it the most um, are contexts where, uh, you, you know, it's, it's unlikely to work very well. So I also highlight we're not the only ones that are finding this. Inhibitory control has this problem. Working memory um, is another one where there was great promise for a while in working memory training. There's been several really large-scale meta-analyses or replication attempts essentially finding null effects of working memory training. So the, the question is, you know, how, what are the conditions? Um, and so some of the direction that we're going is personalized medicine. As, as Mark was noting, you know, if you, if you go dig back into the data and look at kind of uh, single-subject analyses, some, there are some people for whom this works well, and there are some people for whom it doesn't work at all. Um, in fact, some people it can be kind of harmful. Um, and so I, I've partnered up just a little taste of the kind of future direction here with my colleague Eric Stice, who's been running these studies within, a, within eating, in the eating context, uh, looking at overweight and obese people or, or folks at risk for overweight and obesity. Um, and they've, they've had some promising effects as well, but similarly finding these really kind of fickle uh, effects depending on the particulars of the training um, and individual differences that are unknown. And so just our current study, we're adopting, we are, we're adopting machine learning methods to, to really dig into this individual difference problem and to try to identify, you know, we're, we're using several different kinds of training. We have an extremely large sample, and we're, trying to, we're, we're using machine learning to identify patterns of individual differences that map onto training improvements um, in different conditions, looking at things such as the, the diversity of the cues used in the training, you know, the dose response in the training, um, and a few other features. So I, I'll kind of skip over the details of that and just thank uh, you all and my, my lab, uh, my lab group. Everyone was involved in the studies that I talked about and, of course, our funding. So thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Berkman. Uh, we're up against our break, and so I wonder if it would be all right if people directed their questions to you during the break? Sure. Yeah. Oh, thank great. you so much. Welcome back after lunch. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Adriana Yeras Muni. She's going to give a keynote address on the long term effects of cash transfers and other anti poverty programs in the United States. Dr. Yeras Muni is a professor of economics in the Department of Economics at UCLA. In 2017, she was the recipient of the Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers, known as PCASE. And as you know, PCASE is the highest honor bestowed by the U.S. government on early stage independent researchers in science and engineering. Her research led to the first publication estimating the lifetime causal effects of anti-poverty cash programs on children growing up in poverty. We are so pleased that she agreed to be our festival speaker, our keynote speaker this year. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her because I know she's the one you want to hear from. So thank you. Um, sorry, this doesn't work. Uh, oh, hold on. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's a real pleasure. And I will talk to you today about uh, research that I've been doing for about 10 years. And I'm going to be concentrating on the effects of cash transfers. But at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about other anti-poverty programs that I've studied. 
And I want to mention that this is joint work with Anna Iser, Shari Eli, and Joe Ferry at various universities. And uh, I will start by thanking the NIH for the awesome grant that permitted all the work today. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about is based on a paper that's already been published and then on ongoing work. So I will start by mentioning that poverty rates in the United States are high, at least compared to other OECD countries. This is um, data from the OECD from 2016, and it's very difficult to measure poverty, but by most estimates, the United States um, ranks pretty highly in poverty. Um, and I'm measuring here child poverty rates. These rates have gone down a little bit um, in the last few years uh, with the growing economy, but they remain rather high at around 15 to 20 percent for many years. And I guess I don't need to tell people in this room that uh, being poor and growing up poor is a very strong correlate of uh, health, health behaviors, and eventually mortality. So what a lot of people might ask is why, why is there poverty and how do we address it? Why does it persist? And particularly, why is it that children who grow up in poverty remain poor as adults? And so there are many possibilities, and I'm only listing really a few here. Um, unhealthy individuals, people who lack access to health insurance, medical care, may become poor as a result. There are important in neighborhood and intrafamily determinants of poverty. Violence is an important factor. There's neighborhood factors like segregation, um, the quality of the school that you go to. There are things about your parents and how much they invest in you. Um, the factors they're exposed to and whether moms have stress or dads have stress and how that translates into children. And even broader issues at play like the criminal justice system, environmental concerns. So there are really a lot, a lot of factors that are correlated with poverty that can possibly explain why poverty results in poor health um, throughout the lifetime. What we're going to do in this work is we're going to kind of try to, a different approach or a different way of thinking about this problem is, okay, if you give, if poverty, what we measure or we call poverty is the inability to have enough resources to live your life um, well. So what if we give people money? Will that solve the problem? So we're going to try to ask this from a very policy-oriented perspective, if you give poor mothers unconditional cash transfers, do they do better? Do their children do better? And I'll try to specifically answer two questions. Do, we have, if, do means tested cash transfers? By means tested, I mean we give you money only if you're sufficiently poor. So if we do that, does that benefit children in the long run? And why or why not? And by long run here, what I'm going to be looking at is I'm going to be looking at the longevity of individuals, so how old they were when they died. And I'm going to look at intermediate determinants of longevity, education, income, and height and weight. And I'm also going to be asking whether the cash transfers change the behaviors of mothers and do they be benefit mothers or not. And when I talk about behaviors, um, I will be looking at mothers' marriage behaviors, labor supply behaviors, fertility behaviors. And when I talk about her outcomes, I'll also look at her longevity and see how she fares. So let me start with the first question. Um, do cash transfers help? Uh, children growing up in poverty. So I want to point out that it might not be obvious, but uh, most welfare programs in the world originally started with the intent of helping children growing up in poverty. Uh, not necessarily the parents, not necessarily the families or the adults. However, uh, I was surprised to read in an undergraduate textbook that I read that in fact we do not know whether these programs, these welfare programs, help the children, so whether the program actually does what it was intended to do. In the United States, the debate about welfare and cash transfer and poverty programs is dominated by the questions on whether these programs modify the behavior of the recipients, whether there's fraud, whether there's people who are not meant to get these programs who get it, whether people who get the cash stop working or do other things, and there's very little work evaluating whether the programs actually have benefits. And that's what we're setting out to do. 
So if you look at data, what you'll see is that there are correlations, and those are pretty clear. Poor children tend to become poor adults. Poor adults tend to remain poor. Um, we have some evidence from developing countries from randomized control trials um, on conditional cash transfers. And these conditional cash transfers are also means tested. Only poor people get them. But they're conditional in that the recipients only get it if they bring their children to school or bring their children to the doctor or both, or they do a certain number of behaviors. Uh, so these are very popular today, and there have been a large number of evaluations. They're relatively recent, and most of these evaluations have looked at whether these programs improve the education of children. And what we know from that is that there are small but positive effects on education, and we don't know much beyond that. And you might say that that's a great thing and that's, that that's a success, but I want to remind everybody that education is an intermediate outcome, is not necessarily an end in and of itself. If people later on don't turn out to have good lives, then maybe the program wasn't uh, successful. And these effects appear to be relatively small, so we still need to see whether over uh, the long run these, these uh, education benefits translate into broader benefits in terms of um, socioeconomic status. So perhaps not surprisingly, given what I said, you know, there's some surveys, this point is relatively old, but I think it's fair to say that we don't know whether welfare programs have long-term benefits on children. And you might say, well, why is there uncertainty about this? Isn't it a no-brainer that if you're poor, then uh, you do poorly, now we give you money, you're not going to do poorly anymore? And um, there are a lot of arguments against even people cash, and I'm going to summarize them quickly here. The first argument is that income is not always sufficient. So first of all, it's a question of how much money do you give people to really help them out, and it was a sufficient amount. Um, but in particular, one thing that economists think about is that something that happens out there is that, well, if um, the government gives my son a check because he's unemployed, well, maybe I don't give him a check. So that means that some transfers that the public made are crowded out. They crowd out other transfers that either churches, families, or other individuals make. Therefore, the ultimate increases in family income are much smaller than we expect. We give somebody $100, the father takes away $100. Well, that person's income hasn't changed at all. So maybe it doesn't work as well. A second problem is that people might say, uh, it's not the money, it's the parents, so what really matters is what the parents do with the children, and giving people money might not necessarily translate into good actions for their children, and that's the main reason the United States today has moved into mostly in-kind services for poor people. It's the concern that poor parents somehow will take the money, drink it away, use it for drugs, or use it for other stuff, and it will ultimately not benefit the children. Um, there are other reasons people are opposed to these programs. Most notoriously, as I mentioned already, there are incentive effects for parents that these programs dissuade them from working, from marrying, that they promote fertility, they make people move around to chase benefits, and for children, that the children grow up in an environment of a culture of dependency, and they don't try to get out of the system, of course. And then the last reason why cash transfers might not work is that there's stigma associated with receiving benefits, so people might either themselves feel bad that they're being helped or be um, treated poorly by their families and communities. So lots of uncertainty about these programs and lots of difficulty in estimating why or whether they work. So typically welfare or cash transfers in the current system is bundled with a lot of other services. So if you're eligible for cash transfers, you'll be eligible for program, public health insurance programs, housing subsidies, everything else. So it's very hard to separate the effect of the money alone from other programs. It is particularly difficult to establish causal relationships in this setting. So to start with, mothers who show up to apply for welfare, they're disadvantaged along many dimensions. So typically what you'll see is that welfare moms receive money and their children, well, they end up being poor, but is that, does that mean that the money didn't help them? Or does, does it just mean that the mothers were already very disadvantaged and the money just 
wasn't enough to overcome all these disadvantages. So what we're going to try to do here is establish a pro proper counterfactual. What would the outcomes for these children have been had they not received the money? The last difficulty in this research is in tracking people over long periods of time. So we really want to know when you're three, you were poor, what is life like for you when you're 40, 50, 60? And that requires a long time to pass. And ideally, we want to do this for a lot of people. So there are survey data that allows us to track people over time, but they're small possibly unrepresentative, and they have very large amounts of attrition. So for instance, the NLSY or the PSID, you will over 20 years have lost 40% of children, maybe 70% of moms. And not surprisingly, perhaps, most of the people who are lost to the survey are poor. <laughs> so the very people you're interested in, in, in studying. So what are we going to do today? So let me just skip a little bit on what's known. What we're going to do today is uh, I'm going to show you our results from the Mother's Pension Program. This uh, was the first welfare program in the United States, and we've collected historical data on this program to answer these questions. And we collected lifetime data on all the participants from birth to death. That's the, uh, what the historical approach afford us. And we proposed a strategy to try and establish causal effects of the programs. So let me tell you a little bit more about this program. Um, we're going to get data from uh, the Mother's Pension Programs. This is an administrative data set. And these data pertains to people who applied, mothers who applied to this program. And there were no other transfers at this point. So really, they only had this money, and that's all that they could access. We're going to match these administrative data set on applicants to this program. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second to other administrative data sets that it will allow us to establish how people did thereafter. So for children, we're going to match them to death certificates, and that's how we'll know how long they lived. We'll match them to 1940 census and World War II enlistment cards to look at their education. Uh, we'll look at their income in 1940, and we'll look at the anthropometrics heights and weights, which were measured when people enlisted in World War II. And the mothers will do the same, but for the mothers, it's much harder. Uh, because when women remarry, they change their names. It's very hard to track them on, on administrative databases. So here we're going to make use of family trees from family search to track women. And we'll match them to marriage certificates and birth certificates. And then that'll allow us to match her to 1940 records and eventually to her own death records. So thank you, NIH, for funding very large data collection that has taken 10 years or more to do this. So what we're going to do with these records is that we discovered in these records that we have data on people who applied and were rejected, and were told, no, we're not giving you the money, and people who applied and were given the money. And this is how we're going to try and assess the causal effect of the money. And you might immediately be worried that there are lots of reasons to think these groups are not comparable and that this is not valid, so I'm going to spend some time um, talking about this, but what's most important right now is to know that this is not a group of people who might have been poor, who might have applied. All these people showed up to an office. That means they have the same knowledge about the program, the same motivations. One thing that's interesting about this program is historically, back in when this was implemented, first in 1911, um, there was no income data, no IRS records. Most people didn't pay taxes. So the income thresholds were not specified. What the program simply said was if you're poor, you're a woman, you have children under the age of 14, you're eligible for cash transfers, come to our office. So there's not a lot of gaming, if you see what I mean, where people could like, you know, change some behavior or some record in order to be eligible. So these women come to the office. When they were they are initially assessed, and those that are deemed immediately ineligible are not on our records. The women who are on our records are women who applied. They were deemed ineligible. Then, upon investigation, they were rejected. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the challenges are going to be the data quality, and I'm, not, I'm going to gloss over this because there are a lot of issues about matching people across multiple data sets. There's error in matches, and... There's multiple matches sometimes. I'm not going to talk about that much. 
Um, the challenge is, well, are these rejected mothers a good counterfactual or comparison groups for um, the moms who got the money? So what I'm going to do to convince you about that is that I'm going to show you what was stated in the records about why the moms were rejected, and I'm going to try to document how these women compared before they applied to the program. And then I'm going to use alternative counterfactuals. And I want to finish the talk when I get there by talking about external validity and thinking about, you might be saying, but why do we care about what happened way back at the beginning of the 20th century? The people you're talking about are dead. That's why you can study them. But the world was very different then, so I'll think about that. But something that's important to keep in mind is that today, as, as it was true 100 years ago, income is a very strong predictor of education, health, and everything else. So lots of things have changed. Maybe you don't, you give your kid a computer and back then maybe you gave them uniforms. Um, but the people who have money are able to give their kids whatever they need so that they obtain education and that they're healthier. That was true then as it was today. And I think to that extent we can learn a lot. So I'll come back to that later. So let me tell you more about this program. This program was a state program and it was passed these laws were first passed in Illinois in 1911. These programs were very popular. By 1930, 47 states had these programs. Um, at the time, it was similar to many other programs in other developed countries at the time, and it's similar to many developing countries' programs today. One thing that was different was that what the states did is that they said, we're going to adopt this law, and what the law says is within this parameter, each county within the state if it wants, can adopt, implement, and fund this program. So as a result, within a state, some counties had a program and some counties didn't. And in some states like Colorado, only three counties out of the whole state adopted it. So it's, uh, the actual implementation and adoption is very uneven within the states. What we did is collect data from all counties that we could have data for. And why was this program so popular? These, these programs were passed a lot of times by popular vote, and they were very, very popular. And the reason they were popular was that at the time, you might recall um, various uh, orphanage stories by Charles Dickens. Uh, well, at the time, if there was a family that was poor and couldn't care for their children, then children would be placed in orphanages. So particularly if it was a widow, um, her children would be taken away from her and the children would be uh, taken care of by the local um, orphanage or sometimes called training schools. At the turn of the century, a lot of reports started coming out that infant mortality rates at these orphanages were as high as 50%, that malnutrition among orphans in the orphanages were really high, that there were abusive conditions. And so there was a rethinking about uh, the role of the family and President Teddy Roosevelt at the time had a conference um, to talk about how to improve the lot of children. And there was this great idea, instead of giving the money to the orphanages, let's give it to the moms. Isn't it better to keep the children with the moms? And everybody was like, that's awesome. So everybody voted in favor of it because they thought it was either going to save money or cost the same amount of money and everybody was going to come out ahead. And something that's important is that there was already a discussion at the time, but mostly, most people believed that the key was to keep the mom at home with the children. A lot of the individuals that supported these legislation were juvenile district um, judges, who um, juvenile court judges who said, you know, I see a lot of kids in my court, and they're not bad kids, but they're unsupervised, they're on the streets, they're getting in trouble. What we need is to leave, have the mom at home, and we don't want the moms working. So it was almost an implicit requirement if the mom was at work, she would be ineligible because she would have other means and she couldn't supervise her children. So the point was like, we're going to have the mom, she's better than the orphanage, and she's going to stay home because we're going to give her the money so she can stay home and look after her children. And an important thing is that in the background, this came at a time where a lot of these programs originally were called widows programs, where a lot of widows from the Civil War and then from World War I, there was a lot of sympathy for widows, also widows of individuals who worked in manufacturing plants and stuff like that, who died with accidents uh, related from work. 
And there was a lot of sympathy for these widows that through no fault of their own, they found themselves in this circumstance and we should kind of help them. And so this is why it was very popular. Um, there was a lot of variation across states. In the, we were not able to collect data on all states because records have been destroyed or lost in fires or we couldn't find them. We have data from 14 states and there's differences in how these laws were implemented. And I should say that this is the origin of our current welfare system. So as a non-American where I came, I always thought like, why does each state have its own program? Well, what happened was that these programs were very popular, but when the Great Depression came along in 1929, the counties lost all their funds and they couldn't continue the program. And in 1935, the Social Security Administration Act, the Fed said, if you have a program like this, we'll give you matching funds. And so they revived this program and it became ADC, then AFDC, then TANF. So originally each state had done whatever it wanted. Some states gave only widows the pension. Some other states eventually allowed deserted and divorced women to be eligible. Um, some states gave money if your spouse was in a prison or was in an institution like a sanatorium for TB. Some other states didn't. You could get money for each kid you have if the kid was under a certain age. Typically, that was the compulsory schooling age law. So if the state said you had to be in school until age 14, your mom would get money until you were 14. And there were other, other issues, um, other differences across states. So a couple of things that are important. So we don't have data on income from these moms. We do know how much money these moms get, so how much money was it, in effect, that they obtained? So we estimate this in various ways. What we're trying to do here is kind of show you um, how much money they were given by month, so it ranges here from 11 to maybe $30. How much money is that? Well, you can compare to, like, average wages in manufacturing. At the time, manufacturing was a good job, and you'd say it's about 10 to 30 percent of that amount. So it's 10 to 30 percent. It's not small. It's not 100 percent. Advocates at the time thought, oh my God, this is vastly underfunded. You should give money 100, you should give them 100 percent of what they need to live in. And other, other people today might look at that and, and say 30 percent is outrageously high. If you look at, um, as a fraction of total family income, we don't have total family income, but some counties did detailed investigations of the families and do provide records of other sources of incomes from the family. And you can see that in a poor family, not a family with access to a manufacturing wage, this income accounted for like between 30 to 100 percent of their family income. So by that measure, is a lot more generous. On average, in our records, moms uh, receive this money for a median of three years. So half of people had, more, had it for more than three years, and half of the families had it for less. To compare this to modern times, what we can look at is how does this compare with conditional cash transfers around the world? And this is on the generous side of cash, current conditional cash transfers. This is a table from a report that compare these programs around the world. And you can see that in Nicaragua and Mexico, this reaches about 20 to 30 percent of a family's income, and that's on the generous end. If we compare it to current TANF in the United States, TANF in the United States today is about 30 percent of the federal poverty level. So it is much, much less than 30 percent of the average family income or the poor family's income. But, you know, so this program is, by modern standards, on the more generous side. Oh, oh my God. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. So the data comes from county ledgers. They're handwritten records. And let me show you what they look like. Ten years in the making was to transform this data into electronic records. And so this is an application. In this county, this was administered by a juvenile court. And so the woman would come before the court. She would sign this application. So you can see her name. You can see the name of her kids, their date of birth, where they were born. And in this application, is very detailed because this county did a good job. Other counties uh, only recorded the names and dates of birth, and that's about it. Uh, in this case, we actually know that she has some property, that her husband died when he died, 
et cetera. And at the end, if the judge approved, the judge would decide how much money to give them, the, the woman. So this record's actually a little bit longer. So we take these records, we digitize them, we match them to long other databases, as I mentioned before. Um, there's an issue of how we find people. So there's no social security number at this time. This was established in 1936, before these programs was in place. So we have to match people based on names and date of birth and the family structure. So we know that so-and-so's brother with so-and-so. So we use machine algorithms to do this, and we use historians to do this, because it's very difficult to do some of this through machines and particularly because we don't have access to all the databases that one would use. Um, so we have historians do this. And how well do, do we do? We collect data for about 50 to 80% of the recipients. And while this is problematic, we're still missing 20 to 50% of the people in our database don't have information. Compared to survey data and other attempts to match data, we're doing actually really well. We're getting many more people tracked over the lifetime. OK, so what am I going to do with this data? I'm going to compare the outcomes, for instance, the probability that you survive to a given age among those whose families were accepted and were given money to the outcomes of people, children whose mothers were not given the money. They were applied, but they were rejected. We might or might not control for things. So the issues here are, are the rejected families or good control? How do we think about them? And let me talk about that. And let me give you the bottom line for this. The bottom line for this is that in our data, the families who were rejected were slightly better off. So I'm going to show you some evidence for that. That's the reason they were rejected. On average, was that they were deemed to have more means than the families that were not rejected. And that, what that means is that these comparisons between those who got the money and those who didn't are biased against us. We would predict that in the absence of the money, the people who were rejected would have done better than the people who were accepted. Now, we're gonna, uh, now I'm going to show you some evidence of that. So here is a distribution of what the number of kids in the family looks like. You can see that the, the, if a woman showed up with only one kid, she was much more likely to be rejected, whereas if a woman had many kids, she was more likely to be accepted. So on average, the woman who got money had more kids. On average, the women who got money had kids that were younger. So if you can look at the accepted families, more of them have children under the age of five and six, whereas the rejected families are families that have more children that are 12, 13, 14, and 15. So the accepted moms have more kids. They have younger kids. What else is true about that? The youngest kid in the family, again, accepted moms are more likely to have a kid under the age of five. So these families, these moms have more kids, younger kids. They always have a young kid under five. We match these data to Ohio Census data for 1910 and 1920. And then we ask, well, are the accepted moms more likely to be native born? Are they more likely to own a home before they applied for the program? And what would we predict their income to be based on the occupation that they or their family members reported in the census? And what we find is that the um, accepted moms are slightly less likely to be native born, less likely to have owned a home before the program, and we predict their income based on the occupation would have been lower. When we look at the state of Iowa, for which we have a great advantage, there's a 1915 census for Iowa alone that collected family income. It's the only census before 1940 that has this data. And what we find here is that the accepted moms lived in families that had a lower income, that had much lower home ownership rates, that have homes that had lower values, that were less likely to be literate. The only exception here of what I said is that the father's years of schooling goes in the wrong way. So there's a little bit of a worry there, but most of the things we look at, it looks like the accepted moms are worse off. When we look at the reasons why people were denied the money, what we see is that, on average, most people who were denied the money were deemed to be ineligible or have other means. And there is a trail of women who were denied who are deemed to be bad mothers. And so that's also true that there are some uh, rejected applicants who are 
possibly less advantage. So for instance, in one of our records, a woman is denied the transfer because she had an abortion, and abortions were illegal in the state of Connecticut. She's probably quite disadvantaged and quite poor. That's why she had an abortion. But she was deemed to be immoral, and so she was also rejected. What these distribution shows was that, at least on paper, those cases are the minority of cases and not the majority. So we also now got data from the ancestry records, and they allow us to look at even more things about these families before they applied. So in this table, what I'm showing is the number of kids that the mom had who were older than 14. So they were not in our records because they were not eligible for any money. The moms who got the money had fewer kids that were older. And this is important because the older kids could provide support, could provide transfers, could work. So they're a source of support. Um, the moms who got money, they were younger, uh, they were less educated, and they had husbands that had died younger. So I'm going to assume you believe me, the rejected families were on average slightly worse off. So these differences are not that big, but they go in this direction. So if you believe me, then I'm going to show you the results of what these comparisons look like for the children. So how did the children fare? So this is a distribution of the age of death of the boys. So, for, so far, we've only been able to match boys to records. And it shows, on average, that um, the rejected, who are shown in red, had the distribution of death is shifted right compared to the accepted. What this means is that, on average, they lived shorter lives. So on um, the raw data, we get that people who, boys whose moms received the money lived 0.7 years longer. Now we can do this and be more precise. We can look within a county in a given year, so control for county and year, fixed effects. We can control for individual characteristics. We can control for state characteristics. We can control for county characteristics. It doesn't really change very much. The bottom line of these results, if you're looking here, is that the women who were accepted and got money, their boys lived somewhere between one and one and a half years longer as a result. So you might say, maybe you don't like these comparisons between accepted and rejected. So something else that we said is, well, what if we do alternative counterfactuals, alternative ways of thinking of what would have happened to these children had the money not been given to their mothers? So one counterfactual is orphans in orphanages. So we collected data on them. And we looked to see, well, this is what would have happened at this point in time. So I'll show you that. Although you might say that's not very interesting today. Um, that's fair. Uh, we also just looked at children who were poor by picking them out of the census with the caveat that the census does not have income. So the way that we can pick them out is that they're in areas that are poor, their moms are widowed or never married, and so we try to match them on as many characteristics as we can, but it's you know, fuzzy in some sense. But what we see anyway in these is that if you again look at the distribution of the age of death, the accepted group had longer lives the rejected group is very similar to the group of orphans in the data. So the, those who were rejected, they fared similarly to orphans, despite the fact that they're actually slightly of higher socioeconomic status upon application. And then if we compare the uh, accepted moms to, and children to those who were poor in the census, we see again that the accepted families did better than the otherwise poor individuals in the census who were in, were in uh, counties that did not have a program or were in counties where they were not eligible. So these results are rather robust to these alternative comparisons. So you might say, well, why did these children live longer? And so to answer that question, we looked at uh, census records. And so now we look at the education, income, and we also get race by looking at the 1940 outcome. And when you look at the 1940 census, this is what the distribution looks like when we compare accepted and rejected. And what you can see is that children of rejected moms are much more likely to have exactly eight years of schooling, which was primary school level. And the children of accepted moms are more likely to have 12 years of schooling, so they have completed um, high school. So, 
Of course, there's a distribution. Uh, we can look at the numbers and see how much this comes to. When we look at these children in 1940, so just to be clear, these are, we're looking at boys who were born between 1900 and 1925. By the time we catch them in the 1940 census, they're between 15 and 40. Um, not everybody's working. If they are working, we can observe their income for the first time. And in 1940, what we see is that the rejected kids, the boys, precisely the distribution of their income is well below the distribution of income of accepted applicants. And if we look now at the numbers, what this translates into is about 10% higher income in 1940, about 0.3 or 0.4 years more of schooling, and about, as I mentioned before, somewhere between one and one and a half years of longer life. From the World War II enlistment records, we get education again, which is important because this is measured with a lot of error, but what we get is measured anthropometrics. Now, not everybody's in these records, only those who were drafted or enlisted in World War II are in there, so these would be disproportionately the cohorts born between 1915 and 1925, but particularly 17, 18, 19. Um, but for those cohorts, we can look at them, and we see again the same pattern we saw in the 1940 census, which is that the rejected applicants are much more likely to have only an eight-year degree. And nobody in this data set has less than eight years of schooling, and I think the reason for that is that where you were supposed to know how to read and write to be able to enlist, and so there is no record with anybody with less than eight years of schooling. It's interesting. Okay. Um, so on average in this, in this second data set, it's about 0.3 years of education difference between accepted and rejected as well. And more interestingly now, this is the distribution of BMI. Uh, we can also just look at height. Um, but what we see in here is the distributions are similar, but at the lower tail, the accepted boys are more likely to be undernourished measured as the probability that their BMI is below 18.5. So that's another possible mechanism. Now let me spend the last two minutes talking about what happened to the mothers. So one concern, so first of all, whatever the money, mothers did wasn't that bad because we already showed you that the kids did better. But let's take a look at what the mothers did. First of all, did welfare discourage them from remarrying and remaining single? What this shows is that, that moms who were given the money were more likely to remarry. That's in part because they were younger. Once we account for that, there is no difference in lifetime remarriage rates between those who got the money and those who didn't. So now you might say, yeah, wait, but maybe they just waited a lot longer because they had the money and so they just stayed single for a longer period of time. So let's take a look at that. So now we collect the data. We know if they married, how long they married after applying for the money. On average, if they remarried, they remarried somewhere between like five and six years after. And this plots the probability that the mother remains single um, for every year after the application. And what it shows is that the accepted moms are more likely to be single in the first three years after the program. But that difference is relatively small, and after that, there isn't that much difference. And in fact, the, crosses, the, the curves cross. So if we look at the data for this, what you'll see is that on average, the moms did take a little bit longer to remarry, but it's about 0.7 of a year. So six months, eight months, you know, it's not very long. And most of that is because the women who got money appear to not have married in desperation, I want to say within the first three years. So these women show up to an office, they're desperate, they don't have money, and essentially if they don't get the money and they have somebody around they can marry, they do. But you want to note that the marriage rates, the baseline marriage rates are low, only three or eight percent of these women are marrying in the very short run. Who do they women marry? So maybe they marry somebody horrible or maybe they marry somebody better. The data is very ambiguous on this. What we find is that these women married men who lived longer so they were healthier, but who were less educated. So whether that's a good or a bad thing for them and for their children is somewhat ambiguous. So the last set of results I want to show you pertains to how the women did. We do not find that these women lived longer. We do not find that they had more children, even among 
on average as a result. We don't find any effect on their family income in 1940. They are not less likely to be working in 1940. They're not less likely to be having any income. So all of these effects are statistically insignificant and rather small. So on conclusions, um, what we take so far from this project is that on average, the money given to poor mothers does increase child well-being, that the maternal responses are small, that dire predictions on fertility and work are not really observed in our data, and the cash transfers has small effects on the moms, and small effects on their outcomes or no effects on her outcomes. So the benefits of the programs really accrue to the children rather than the mom. Was this program worth it? You can do a quick back of the envelope calculation, and the answer is yes, the program paid for itself. Well, I, I'm over time, but uh, mm, so maybe I'll just uh, stop, I'll stop right now. <laughs> All right. OK. Um, so I want to finish by saying that in current United States, there's been great emphasis on in-kind transfers to solve these problems of maternal responses, et cetera. In-kind programs are expensive. They're complicated to administer. They leave a lot of people out. And these programs were in some sense, are in some sense administratively much cheaper. An important area of research for us is, would be to compare how these income transfers or cash transfers compare to other kinds of transfers, the transfers that we have today, and whether at the end of the day, um, the hurdle that you place on people with multiple systems for housing, et cetera, et cetera, is worth its cost or not. We don't have good evidence on the benefits of those programs for children, and we'd like to have a comparison for that. So in that spirit, something that I'm working on, I've worked a lot on compulsory schoolings and showing that compulsory schooling did increase longevity among the same cohorts that I'm studying right now. So an interesting question is to say, is it better to force children to go to school? Is it better to give the money to the mom? Or is it better to do something else? So another piece of work that I have right now is looking at the CCC program. The CCC program was a program established by Roosevelt, second Roosevelt in the 1930s uh, to help young men ages 18 to 25 who were poor and could not be employed during the Great Depression. We find that that program also increased longevity. There's a belief these days that um, the money is only when spent if you spend it in euro or the first five years of life, but that's not clear from our data. Uh, when we look at the benefits for younger children, uh, middle, uh, you know, children under the age of five, five to 10, 10 to 14, we find relatively similar benefits, and we also find benefits for these other program that looks at relatively young adults. So I think it remains to be seen whether at the end of the day it's more cost effective to always just spend in the early um, years or, or, or not. I'm not, I'm not convinced. Um, we, we only have results for boys right now, so I have my NIH hat when I say I must have things by gender, so I'm trying to collect that data uh, to also say something about whether the girls benefited from what happened and not just the boys. Um, and the last question that I want to look at this was, is trying to understand the mechanisms better and trying to understand whether these long-term benefits that we see, could we have measured them in the short run? So I think there's great, um, um, a lot of evidence these days that the markers we observe in the short run and that we use to assess success of programs can be very deceiving about the eventual benefits or cost of the programs that we look at. And so another avenue for research is to try to compare what would have we have done if we measured this program and its success, you know, one year or two years or three years after the program, kind of in the, in the manner that we do today, would we have seen these benefits? Would we, have, would we have abandoned the program? And I suspect that the answer is yes, that we probably would have found no effects in the short run but we're seeing fairly large effects now. This is something I want to work on. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm over time for five minutes is bad. <laughs> Thank you.
My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, as I see, always concerned about the data, how do you verify your data, whether the income or whether the benefit received by the parents or like if you have any human capital, how do you really measure their education level or whether do you have any social program like school lunch and this sort of things? Whether they really receive that lunch program or they are hungry every day? So there are no such programs at the time, although they're starting to be implemented in different states. The, the money went to the mothers. The records tell us how much money went to the mothers. Um, I, I showed you some um, evidence on that. What we do not know and we do not have data on is on how the mothers spend the money. There are some small studies that so various counties went back and supervised the moms. We know that a lot of the children in, in those small studies uh, were undernourished and they had medical problems. Presumably the reason they end up in our data set as heavier, taller, and they live longer is that some of the money was used for um, fighting disease and for proper nutrition. We, I do not know how the money was spent by the mothers, but we do see that the children show up in the 1940 records and the World War II records with more education and they show up with more income. So whatever the mothers did, however they spent the money, they ended up doing better. But the, the beauty of studying this program is that there's very little being done by the government or anything else to directly or indirectly help uh, these families. So we can really pin down the effect of the money on the money itself and not anything else occurring at the time. This said, you know, if we could, could collect additional data on what else was happening at the county level, it might be informative. This is a period of great change. There's like increases in compulsory schooling and other things. So it could be that in some areas, people who got the money benefited more, and in some areas they benefited less because of the broader context of what's happening in the county. And as of right now, I don't have anything to say about that. Sure, so amazing amount of work. Congratulations on getting this all together and done. Um, I'm curious um, if you, um, and I hesitate to ask this given the amount of work I think it would be, but um, I, I'm curious, uh, is it possible to look at what happens to the children's children, sort of across generations? <laughs> I think the answer is yes and no in the following. So right now, one a major piece of work that we're doing right now is that we're linking all of these people to family trees. So almost everybody here has family trees. So I know, now I know, I can even track the grandparents of these kids and I can track the kids of the kids. And the problem is that if you go backwards in time, the grandparents, it's harder to know anything about them other than their name and whatever, and so it's hard to track data long term. And moving forward, the people who are alive, it's very hard to track data on them from administrative databases. And so I think you can find out who those people are because they'll be on the trees. Um, but then finding out things about them is substantially harder. But in principle, yes. So that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Alfonso Ladoni um, from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences uh, in the Scientific Review Branch. Uh, this is the one institute, the one and only institute of the NIH that's not in Bethesda. It's in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. So I'm very pleased to have traveled up. Thank you for not forgetting <laughs> that there is one institute that's not here, it's down there. Uh, and I'm very honored to uh, be the moderator of session two, which is population and epidemiology research, 
We have two distinguished speakers for this session. The first speaker will be Dr. Julia Sen Chen, who is a postdoctoral fellow here at the NIH's National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Chen will present on behalf of Dr. Kelvin Choi. The title of her talk is Learning from the Opponent, How to Turn Tobacco Direct-to-Consumer Marketing into Public Health Interventions. Then Dr. Chen will be followed by Dr. Sherry Weiser, who is Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. The title of Dr. Weiser's talk is Food for Thought, Examining the Vicious Cycle of Food Insecurity and Poor Health. And we would have had a final speaker, Dr. Jennifer Buher Kane from the University of California, Irvine, but unfortunately, she was not able to attend last minute. So, Dr. Um, each, like, you know, like we've been doing, each speaker uh, will have 20 minutes, more or less, and then there'll be time for Q&As after each of them. So, Dr. Chen, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Dr. Latoni, for the introduction, and thanks, OBSSR, for the invitation to present our work on um, tobacco direct-to-consumer marketing into public health interventions. I'm Julia Chen, a postdoctoral fellow at NMHD. I am presenting um, on behalf of Dr. Kelvin Choi, who is a statement investigator at NMHD. Um, Dr. Choi conducts research on tobacco use disparities, tobacco marketing, and tobacco counter-marketing. Dr. Choi cannot make it, make it here today because he's presenting at another conference, and he sends his sincere apologies. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the work we have done to tobacco, on tobacco direct-to-consumer marketing and how we can harness the same marketing strategies used to the, by the tobacco company to promote public health. So just a standard disclaimer. So first of all, what is direct-to-consumer marketing? There are two main types. The first one is available to consumers at the point of sale, such as gas stations and tobacco shops. Here's a picture of a cigarette wall at a convenience store. Do you see price promotions that are being marketed to, to consumers directly? Here they are. You can see they're directly communicating special prices like 50% off or 75% 70, off for a pack of cigarettes. I believe many of you have seen this at gas stations or tobacco shops before. And the second type of direct-to-consumer marketing is direct mail coupons. This is an example of what people receive at their home. You can tell from the color of this coupon that this is for Marlboro cigarettes, and there is a nice picture showing the Wild West theme at the bottom. And here are the coupons. This time it is a dollar off a pack of cigarettes. The regular price for a pack of cigarettes is about 6 to $7 in the state of Maryland. So $1 off is like a 15 to 20% off discount. And then here they are promoting their mobile app, MHQ, where consumers can sign up for more coupons and promotions on their smartphones. Now, some of you may have received direct mail coupons for a variety of products, such as clothing and furniture, and most of you would just throw them away. In fact, marketing research has shown that, in general, coupon redemption rate is only about 1% to 3% in the U.S. However, it is not the case for secret coupons. Dr. Choi has previously examined the proportion of Minnesota smokers who received secret coupons in the past 12 months. Using the Minnesota Adult Tobacco Survey cohort study data, he found that 49% of adult smokers received these coupons in the past 12 months, and 40% of them redeemed those coupons, which means among those who have received coupons, as high as 80% of them redeemed the coupons for cigarettes. Dr. Choi then has extended his research to national U.S. adults. 
Here he used data from the population assessment on tobacco and health study, a nationally representative prospective cohort study to examine who received those coupons. At wave one, over 32,000 U.S. adults completed the survey. They provided information about whether they had received cigarette coupons or promotions in the mail or through emails in the past six months. They also reported their smoking behaviors 12 months prior to completing wave one survey. Based on their responses, they were classified into non-smokers and current smokers 12 months prior to wave one. Here are some results for non-smokers. Overall, 12% of non-smokers reported receiving coupons. The blue graph shows the breakdown by education. Dr. Choi found that those who had lower education attainment were more likely to have received those coupons. The green graph shows the breakdown by poverty level. Those who were financially poor were more likely to have received these coupons. These models adjusted for age, gender, race, ethnicity, and census region. Here are some more results for current smokers. Overall, 35% of current smokers in the U.S. reported receiving cigarette coupons. By education, those who received some college education were more likely than those who completed college to have received those coupons. The lower education categories are just above the 0.05 significance level. However, the story for poverty level is the same as non-smokers. Those who were financially poor were more likely to have received these coupons. This model is also adjusted for age, gender, race, ethnicity, and census region. Now, you may think that those who received the coupons have signed up for them. In fact, very few of the sample reported signing up for coupons. This shows that the tobacco industry is targeting lower SES smokers who have the highest prevalence of smoking with direct to consumer marketing activities. The next thing we investigated is how these coupons influence smoking behaviors. We used the past wave one and two data to answer this research question. Since we have more detailed information about smoking behaviors at wave one, we were able to further divide, divide the sample into five different subpopulations. Never smokers, experimenters, non-daily smokers, current smokers, which include daily and non-daily smokers, and former smokers. We then examined the demographic characteristics associated with receiving cigarette coupons at wave one in each of these subpopulations. As you can see in this table, while gender and age and the race ethnicity are associated with coupon receipt in some subpopulations, education and poverty levels are consistently associated with coupon receipts across never smokers, experimenters, current smokers, and former smokers as you can see at the last two rows of this table. Before I show you more results from this study, let me first orient you to the developmental stages of cigarette smoking. These stages include from never smoking a puff of cigarette to ever smoking a puff of cigarette. So from never to ever, and then from to aspilish smoking behaviors which means smoking 100 cigarettes or more in a lifetime, and then to smoking regularly but not every day, non-daily smokers, and finally to smoking every day, daily smokers. First, let's look at initiation from never to ever smoking. The blue bar represents those who receive coupons at wave one. The red bar represents those who did not receive coupons. As you can see, the blue bar is taller than the red bar. This means that the proportion of adults who initiated smoking is higher among those who received coupons than, the, than those who did not. Next, from aspilish smoking, sorry, from ever smoking to aspilish smoking, we found similar results. The blue bar is taller than the red bar. This means the proportion of adults who transition from ever smoking to aspilish smoking is higher among those who received coupons than those who did not. Next, we look at from non-daily smoking to daily smoking. Once again, the blue bar is taller than the red bar. 
This means that the proportion of adults who transition from non-daily to daily smoking is higher among those who received coupons than those who did not. This is about cigarette sm smoking progression. Now let's look at the results about smoking cessation and relapse from the same study. First, let's look at quitting smoking. Once again, the blue bar represents those who receive coupons and the red bar represents not. This time, the blue bar is shorter than the red bar. This means that the proportion of adult smokers who quit smoking between wave one and two is lower among those who received coupons than those who did not receive the coupons. What about smoking relapse? Now the blue bar is taller than the red bar. This means that the proportion of adult smokers who relapse back to smoking between wave one and two is higher among those who received coupons than those who did not. Overall, this results show that, show that the tobacco industry is able to use direct-to-consumer marketing to influence smoking behaviors in the U.S. adult population. In another study, Dr. Choi found that these coupons do not only influence smoking behaviors, but also shape the perception of the tobacco industry among smokers. Using data from Minnesota, Dr. Choi found that comparing to smokers who did not receive coupons, those who received coupons are more likely to agree that cigarette companies care about their health and try to make cigarettes safe. They are also less likely to agree that cigarette companies lie. Of course, we all know that tobacco companies don't care about people's health and have only tried to make cigarettes more addictive. But this shows that well-designed direct-to-consumer campaigns can influence corporate image. Given the strong impact of direct-to-consumer marketing on smoking progression, what can we do about it? One strong policy option is prohibiting tobacco price promotions. Dr. Choi's study using data from the International Tobacco Control Project showed that in countries where price promotions are allowed, those who are exposed to price promotions are about twice as likely to smoke than those who are not exposed to price promotions. However, in countries where price promotions are prohibited, there is no significant differences between receiving coupons or not in terms of cigarette smoking status. Now that we know coupons work, how do we harness this power for good? Here, let me share an example with you. In Minnesota, there is a National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program that provides low-income individuals with free cancer screening services. The Minnesota Department of Health decided to promote telephone smoking cessation counseling in this population. They used two strategies to recruit smokers to use telephone counseling. First, direct mail which involved two mailings to smokers, offering $20 incentives if they called the cessation counseling phone number on the mailing. Second, opportunistic referral with connection, which they refer smokers to counseling when they call to schedule canceling, cancer screening, with $20 incentives for connecting. And then the results show that direct mail works. This is the result table from the paper. Since this is not a randomized trial, the authors have to adjust for confounding. Their data show that when compared to opportunistic referral with connection, those who were exposed to direct mail recruitment were more likely to use telephone sensation counseling quit line and were also more likely to reach continuous smoking cessation, defined as not smoking for at least 30 days as seven months after their intervention. So in conclusion, tobacco companies have successfully used direct-to-consumer marketing strategies to influence smoking behaviors and their corporate images. Regulating those strategies can protect public health, especially when cigarette smoking is still the leading cause of preventive deaths in the U.S. and the use of emerging tobacco products such as e-cigarettes is on the rise among young people in the country. Finally, it is possible to harness these marketing strategies for promoting the programs and policies aimed at protecting public health. 
This is all my presentation for today. Again, thanks again for the opportunity to present at the conference. If you have any questions, please direct to us. Thank you. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. I just wonder if you take into account their family characteristic, like income and whether they are employed or not, and whether the children they they have supplemental income, like a second job or something for the family. Um, for the coupon studies we did, we look at education level and poverty level. Um, we did not look at the assistance they, re they receive, federal assistance they receive, but I think it's highly correlated with their income level and education level. So I think we kind of take that into account. Um, we also look at include confounding variables such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, and census region. So hopefully that will... Um, explain some of the other variants. Do, do, that, they, do they receive a social program, social benefit program? Uh, we did not include that in our model, but in the future maybe we can look at uh, if those who receive um, social support programs, assistance programs, whether that will influence the outcome of coupon receipts or smoking status. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Any questions about tobacco in general, or e-cigarettes, or juice, or flavored tobacco? Or <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. So for an overview of what I will be covering, um, I will spend the first half talking about how food insecurity worsens health for HIV and other chronic diseases. And then I will turn to studies on food security interventions and how they can reverse the vicious cycle of food insecurity and poor health. So let me start with a definition. First, food security is defined as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. And food insecurity, conversely, is the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate safe foods or the inability to acquire what's thought to be personally acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. And there are four essential components of food insecurity, insufficient quantity of food, insufficient quality, feelings of de deprivation and restricted choice and anxiety about the amounts and types of foods available, and finally, being unable to procure food in socially acceptable ways. So for instance, without having to beg, rely on charity, or steal. Food insecure individuals um, often are in a situation where they have to resort to unhealthful coping strategies in order to avoid hunger. So they may be in a situation where they could only eat nutrient, poor, energy dense, cheap foods to fill their stomachs. They may spend their limited resources on getting food instead of transport to the clinic or getting their medicines, and they may engage in strategies like exchanging sex in order to procure food, and all of these coping strategies can contribute to the higher risk of HIV and other chronic diseases and worse outcomes once they are affected. Food insecurity is highly prevalent in this country. It's estimated that 40 million people live in food insecure households, and food insecurity disproportionately impacts low income and minority households. There is a robust body of literature showing that food insecurity can worsen health along the entire cascade of care for chronically ill individuals, all the way from disease acquisition to death. And I'll show you how this plays out in the context of HIV. So food insecure individuals have three times the odds of acquiring HIV infection, have twice the odds of missing clinic visits, have 2.7 times higher odds of non-adherence to antiretroviral therapy, have 70% higher odds of failing their HIV therapy, 45% higher odds of progression to AIDS, and are two times more likely to die compared to individuals who are food secure. Food insecure, here's a conceptual framework we developed to really demonstrate the bi-directional links between food insecurity and poor health. 
So food insecurity directly contributes to poor nutritional status, poor mental health, and poor adherence to treatment and care recommendations, which then contributes to worsened health in HIV and other chronic diseases. This will then drive utilization of expensive health care services like hospitalizations and emergency room visits, which drives up health care costs. And then as a result of increasing disability and out-of-pocket health expenses, this then further entrenches individuals in a vicious cycle of, um, it, the further, further entrenches individuals into poverty and unemployment, which then perpetuates this vicious cycle between food insecurity and poor health. So to elaborate on the pathways for how food insecurity negatively impacted health, I'm going to be highlighting in uh, the next few minutes some findings from our recently completed R01 study within the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which is um, a longitudinal cohort across nine sites in the U.S. of HIV-infected and at-risk women. And our, we were looking in this study on the nutritional, mental health, and behavioral pathways through which food insecurity impacts not only HIV treatment outcomes, but also cardiovascular risk outcomes. And we also wanted to look at a novel outcome and mediator, which is increased inflammation and immune activation related to food insecurity. So looking at the nutritional pathway, many studies show that food insecurity contributes to both micronutrient and macronutrient malnutrition, which is a pathway towards worse health for chronic disease. And food insecurity is also a growing contributor to the obesity epidemic in this country and elsewhere. For example, in an analysis led by Nicole Sirotin in Wise in the Bronx, we found that food insecure, HIV-infected, and at-risk women had over twice the odds of being obese in adjusted analyses compared to women who were food secure. Food insecurity is also one of the most important determinants of poor mental health among individuals living in poverty. It contributes to depression, anxiety, and drug and alcohol use disorders, which in turn are important pathways towards worse chronic disease health. For example, in the WISE cohort, in an analysis led by Emily Toothill, um, we found that um, food insecurity was associated in a dose-dependent fashion with both worse depression scores um, as measured by CESD, which is a validated depression screener, and worse mental health summary scores as assessed by the validated SF36 scale. And we also found that past food insecurity had independent associations, negative associations with these outcomes. Um, and those that fared the worst were those who had pers persistent food insecurity at multiple time points. In terms of other mental health outcomes, in an analysis led by Harry Whittle, we also found that food insecurity had dose response relationships with generalized anxiety disorder scores and PTSD symptom scores. And those who were food insecure also had higher odds of screening positive for generalized anxiety disorder and screening positive for post-traumatic stress disorder. And in another analysis led by Harry Whittle and also along the mental health pathway, we found that food insecurity was an important, uh, was, had very strong associations with substance use. And we found dose response relationships with any illicit substance use and specific categories of abuse, including cannabis use, stimulant use, and opioid use. And you again can see uh, some similar, although slightly weaker, associations with past food insecurity. And again, those that fared the worst were those who had persistent food insecurity. So in terms of uh, health behavior pathways, studies show that food insecurity is an important predictor of medication non-adherence, treatment interruptions, and missed clinic visits which are very important pathways towards worse health in HIV and other chronic disease. So in an analysis led by Kartika Pillar, we looked at associations between food insecurity and antiretroviral non-adherence along four categories. So no non-adherence was the referent category. And we compared that to mild non-adherence, which was 95 to 99% of doses, moderate non-adherence, which was taking 75 to 94% of doses, and severe non-adherence, which was less than 75% of doses. And we used multinomial regression models here. And what you can see really is dose response relationships going in multiple directions. So both as the degree of food insecurity worsens and as the degree of non-adherence worsens. 
You can also see, again, uh, some independent associations with previous food insecurity. And again, I sound a little bit like a broken record, but those that had um, persistent food insecurity did fare the worse. So next, we looked at associations between food insecurity and HIV treatment outcomes. And what you see here are the results of four adjusted models. And the statistically significant findings are bolded. The first model looks at associations with food insecurity and viral load using TOBIT models, which captures both whether the participant is suppressed or non-suppressed, as well as the magnitude of viral load, which is an important indicator of transmissibility to others. And the second shows uh, being suppressed or non-suppressed. And you can see that food insecurity had uh, important dose-response relationships with both of these outcomes. Those with very low food security, which is the highest category of food insecurity, also had lower CD4 cell counts. And all categories of food insecurity were associated with worse physical health status, again, in a dose-dependent fashion. So next, tying together these outcomes and pathways together, we wanted to assess mediators for how food insecurity was affecting HIV treatment outcomes. So we tested several candidate mediators along the nutritional, mental health, and behavioral pathways and chose the strongest mediator along each pathway in our final mediation models. So for um, the nutritional pathway, body mass index was the strongest mediator for the viral load models, but actually fruit and vegetable intake was the strongest nutritional mediator for the CD4 cell count and physical health status models. For the behavioral pathway, non-adherence to antiretroviral therapy was the most important mediator for all the models, and depression was the most important mental health mediator for all outcomes. What the findings show here is that actually different mediators played a different role depending on the outcomes. So look at the viral load models, which were quite similar. Adherence was by far and away the most important mediator, accounting for 30% of the total effect, with um, body mass index accounting for less than 3% of the total effect. Depression was not a direct mediator, but did operate indirectly via adherence. So food insecurity contributing to depression, contributing to non-adherence, contributing to poor virologic outcomes. You can see that for the CD4 cell count models, both adherence and depression accounted for about 15% of the total effects. And for physical health status, depression was the most important mediator, accounting for 60% of the total effects. And it was also uh, the only significant mediator. So I think the takeaway points here are that different mediators are important for different outcomes, and that behavioral and mental health pathways are particularly important to target for interventions. I've talked a lot about HIV, and I just want to point out that food insecurity is also associated with many other chronic diseases. So population-based studies across the U.S. show that food insecure individuals have twice the odds of having diabetes, 20% higher odds of hypertension, 30% higher odds of having high cholesterol, over three times the odds of osteoporosis, and 46% higher odds of chronic kidney disease. And here's, um, in the WISE study, we actually looked at how food insecurity related to diabetes control among HIV-infected and at-risk women with diabetes, and found that women with very low food security had worse, blood, had worse diabetes control as assessed by fasting blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C levels, which is the key metric of blood sugar control, and we also found that they had lower odds of having optimal glucose and hemoglobin A1C control. So in, finally, in an analysis led by Anna Letty, we also found that food insecurity was associated with inflammatory markers in the blood, including IL-6 and TNFR1 in adjusted analyses. And this really is likely an important pathway for how food insecurity may contribute to both worse HIV health and chronic disease health. So how do we begin to address this vicious cycle of food insecurity and poor health? Well, studies do in fact show that food security interventions can reverse this vicious cycle I've just gone over, can contribute to improved HIV and chronic disease health, improved quality of life, decreased acute care use, and health costs. As an example of this, Kartika Pilar and I co-led a randomized control trial in the Bay Area with Project Open Hand, which is a free meal distribution or organization, which we called Changing Health Through Food Support, or the CHEF's randomized control trial. 
and the goal was to provide comprehensive nutrition to HIV-infected participants and look at the impacts on health outcomes. And we indeed found that the intervention improved health along nutritional, mental health, and behavioral pathways. So using a difference-in-difference approach, we found that, um, that intervention participants had 77% lower odds of food insecurity, 68% lower odds of screening positive for depression, and 82% lower odds of having less than 90% antiretroviral adherence. We did not find statistically significant improvements in viral suppression, and happy to discuss some of our hypotheses for the reasons for that in the discussion. But we did find 95% lower odds of unprotected sex in the intervention participants, which is an important pathway towards HIV transmission to others, and importantly found an 89% lower odds of hospital stays in the previous three months, which is, again, a very important indicator of um, improvements in health care costs. So other studies do show that food support interventions can improve other health, chronic health indicators. For example, at least three studies show that providing diabetes-appropriate food support can improve diabetes outcomes, and all of these studies showed improvements in hemoglobin A1c. And I just want to point out that actually food support is actually a relatively inexpensive intervention. It is estimated that you could feed someone their entire uh, nutritional requirements for half a year for the same cost as spending one day in the hospital. So as a result of all of the data linking food insecurity with poor health, in San Francisco last year alone, the Getting to Zero campaign, the HIV Getting to Zero campaign in San Francisco spent $5 million um, on fighting uh, food insecurity as a way to improve HIV outcomes. And Governor Brown recently, or last year, had approved a statewide pilot demonstration project to incorporate medically tailored meals as part of Medi-Cal. So food support is clearly a very beneficial and important intervention. But going back to the definition of food insecurity that I showed you earlier, um, people who are reliant on health programs or clinics for food may find that socially unacceptable. They may find it, um, you know, that they have ongoing anxiety and uncertainty about the food supply. On the other hand, livelihood interventions help to target some of the root causes of food insecurity, and in so doing, may be better able to address the mental health, behavioral, and nutritional pathways through which food insecurity negatively impacts health. And when you're thinking about these longer-range approaches, it's really important to to create transdisciplinary partnerships. So moving beyond just the health sector and non-governmental organizations and bringing in non-traditional partners like agriculture, finance, and others. So we tested one such approach along with my colleagues Craig Cohen and Elizabeth Bakusi from the Kenyan Medical Research Institute. The intervention was called Shamba Maisha, which means farming for life in Kiswahili. And the goal was to target the root causes of poverty and food insecurity in the region which in this case was infrequent rain rainfall patterns and an increasing frequency of drought occurring in the setting of climate change. We tested this initially in an R34 with 140 people. The intervention had three components, a microfinance loan to purchase a human-powered water pump and other farming implements, and then education in sustainable farming practices and financial management. So we had hypothesized that this multi-sectoral intervention would first improve food security and household wealth, and then through the pathways I've already shown you, as well as through enhanced empowerment, would lead to decreased HIV morbidity and mortality. And in the next few slides, you'll note that the intervention group are shown in the red circles and the control group, in the blue circles and the control group in the red Xs. You'll note, note at baseline very high and similar levels of food insecurity in both groups. By six months, we already saw statistically significant improvements in food security in the intervention compared to the control group, which persisted throughout the rest of the trial. In terms of viral suppression, you'll note that a higher proportion of control participants were suppressed at baseline, which again attests to the need for a larger randomized control trial. But the, by six months, these trends had reversed, and the statistically significant improvements in viral suppression persisted throughout the rest of the trial. And this was one of the first studies that we know of to look at um, 
of food security interventions to look at impacts on HIV clinical indicators. And we also saw very parallel and statistically significant improvements in CD4 cell count in intervention compared to control participants. And finally, as a measure of empowerment, we also saw statistically significant improvements in self-confidence. Our qualitative data also attested to the nutritional, mental health, and behavioral mechanisms through which the intervention improved health. And I'll just read two quotes here. Along the mental health pathway, a participant says, it has given me hope and will to do my things, not like before when I used to be hopeless and scared. I also have the will to go about my duties and farm from which I get food and money, thus living like any other person. And along the behavioral pathway, a participant says, I find getting to the clinic to be a little easier because now I'm able to get money from my fare to the clinic. I get the money from the farm produce. And the intervention had other far-reaching impacts um, beyond HIV. And here is um, some descriptions of reduction in violence that our participant uh, talk, talked about. And here's a quote from a male participant. I used to be violent. The violence would mostly relate to money issues, and this is the root cause in many homes. But right now, she, takes, she manages the farm and takes it as hers. Now she has some few coins in the pocket, and if I need some money, I can always ask her. So it is taking care of some form of domestic violence to some very big extent. And finally, I just want to mention that this intervention also impacts other household members. Lisa Butler had a paired R21 study to look at impacts on uh, health and nutrition in the children and found that compared to children in control households, children in intervention households had greater increases in weight and consumption of legumes, fruit and vegetables, meat and fat. And we're now in the fourth year of an R01 study to um, investigate these impacts across 16 communities in three counties in Kenya. And in addition to our R01, which is looking at impacts on adult HIV health outcomes, Lisa Butler has a paired R01 looking at the impact on child nutrition, health, and development. And we also were recently funded on a R21 from NICHG to look at impacts on adolescent girls' sexual and reproductive health. So in summary, we've seen that food insecurity worsens health through, nutri through nutritional, mental health, and behavioral pathways. We've seen that food insecurity interventions can reverse the cycle and multiply and sustain the benefits. And I hope I've shown you that improving food insecurity can help address multiple health problems simultaneously. And the final point I want to make is that given that climate change is a huge driver of food insecurity in many parts of the world, I urge you to consider environmentally sustainable approaches in the food security interventions. And I'll just leave up my acknowledgments. I had way too many collaborators to list here. Special thanks to my NIMH project officer, Michael Sterrett, who has supported me for many years with this work, and to my funders listed here, uh, including NIMH, NIAD, and NICHD. Thank you. Presentation. My name is Li Yang. Uh, you have a lot of variables there. Like, and I uh, wonder, do you include a, a nutrition supplement like a school lunch? And you have mental health and uh, you have a behavioral problem. Do you worry whether they are real problem or they are just seen as uh, mental ill? If a, if a student complain against the, the school administration or against their school teacher, they will be sent to the mental health, something like that. Or they will be like, like uh, label them inferior or uh, ask them to go out of the school room. So Do you're, you that? you're or, saying that sometimes kids who are food insecure are labeled as having mental health problems as opposed to um, structural problems that need to be addressed. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Some sort of they, whether they, you verify they are really mental health or they, you just depend on the school or label them. So first of all, most of the data I presented was among adults. So we haven't really looked into that um, in terms of um, the I impacts in schools. But it is true that, um, food, that addressing food insecurity among children um, has been shown to improve behavioral 
problems in school performance and a number of other development outcomes and is also associated with uh, decreased symptoms of mental illness. The mental illnesses that I was showing here um, that we screened for, these were just screeners for mental illness, so they weren't actual diagnoses of mental illness. And the ones that we really looked at in these data are depression, um, anxiety, and PTSD symptoms. So those were the ones that we have data on. And I don't know if I the nutrient, nutrient users, you measure the school lunch by their dollar value, or you really verify the student really take the school yeah. lunch? Right. I, th I think that our data don't speak to that because we didn't have any data on school lunches, but I think that's an important area to further research, so thank you. Elton Brewington, um, agency. I'm curious, what impact um, did you look at to review for fast food services? And also, second question, was there a review for location or regions that regarding food chain and food chain outlets? So sorry, the first question was what? Um, fast food. Let's, fast uh, food, yes. Fast food, yeah, yeah. No, no impact. I want to see what you have yeah. to say about that. So I think that um, one of the important mechanisms through which food insecurity is negatively impacting health is that what people can afford is very unhealthful foods like fast foods, and so that is you know, a strong contributor to the obesity epidemic. In terms of, we actually, one of the aims of, a, of one of our studies right now is going to be to look at some of those geographical uh, contributors to, um, we're looking, um, using geocoding, to look at many neighborhood level and community level drivers of food insecurity, because we have, in this WISE cohort, we have nine regions and people live, even within the nine sites, people live in very diverse areas within the sites. So we are gonna be teasing apart some of those neighborhood level drivers. And our, we also have a qualitative study where um, you know, people do talk a lot about um, some of the contributors to their poor health being their limited access to um, fruit, to access to fruits and vegetables, their limited access to resources for physical activity. Um, their inability, their lack of access to educational resources around food insecurity, which differ significantly by neighborhood. Um, thanks. It was very interesting, and I, some connections I would not have made between food insecurity and public health issues. Um, at the outset, when you provided the definition, I was, wasn't clear if all four of those components need to be met in order for someone to be considered food insecure? And then part two of that is would the interventions need to address all of them or are there interventions that are just focused on one or two components? Mm -hmm. well, that's an excellent question. So the, there's several different food insecurity scales used. So most of them do cover all components, although some of the scales don't um, cover the social unacceptability. So they, and then in terms of how these, there's very, com there's complex algorithms for how to score these. So if anybody has gone to bed hungry, no matter, irrespective of what they've addressed with the, you know, other questions they will score as severely food insecure. Usually people who are in the more mild range have a lot of anxiety about their food supply, but may have adequate food, qual you know, quantity. Then you sort of move into poor quality food, and, you know, at the very end you see people with poor, with not enough food to eat. Um, but I will say that most of the scales do cover all components, but you don't necessarily need to screen positive for all those components to screen positive for food insecurity. In terms of interventions, um, no, they don't address all components. Like, as I had mentioned, if you're getting food support um, from a food bank or from a soup kitchen, well, you may have anxiety about your food supply, and you may feel that you're um, procuring your food in socially un you know, unacceptable ways, so it's addressing some components of food insecurity and not others. Um, so I think that the more upstream you go, the more likely you are to address the multiple components. So maybe sup, you know, supplemental nutrition assistance program you know, would address more of those. Um, and then you know, addressing root causes through livelihoods you know, may be able to target all of those components a little more effectively.
Okay, now we're gonna take a break. So you'll see that there's a schedule change um, due to time um, savings. Uh, and we will take a break until 2.55. So session three will begin at 2.55. So we'll see you back then. Thanks. So I'm Augie Diana. I'm with National Institute of Nursing Research, and which has pretty much nothing to do with what this panel's about. But um, I did get a chance to review a couple of the papers that are in the panel uh, in their submissions, and they looked really cool, so I'm glad they got selected to participate. So I'm going to do what everybody else did and just uh, read from a script they gave me about what's coming up. Uh, as you've heard before, the speakers will each have 20 minutes to, to talk and about five minutes after each one for questions, and I'll kind of moderate that question and answer. <clears throat> uh, and uh, that's it. I'm going to tell you the rest now about what you're here for. Uh, the panel is called, it's the third panel with speakers, uh, with, with speakers from the field. It's called Intervention Research in the Behavioral and Social Sciences. There are three speakers in this session, as was scheduled for the others. First is Mark Adams from Arizona State University in Phoenix, and he'll be discussing built environment and adaptive physical activity interventions, testing for interactions. Second speaker will be Jared Van Stan from Harvard Medical School, presenting his work on ambulatory biofeedback, investigating factors that affect the permanence of vocal behavior change in daily life. That was one of the ones I got to read. It was really cool. Uh, and then the third speaker will be Jeff Sparks from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And his talk is entitled, Translating Epidemiologic Risk Factors into Intervention, Personalized Medicine, Behavior Change, and Chronic Disease Prevention. Okay, so again, uh, you'll see me again when uh, the first speaker, Mark, Mark's ready to go, uh, is done and uh, to field questions, and then we'll move progressively through the next two. Okay, well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to NCI and uh, Dr. Frank Perna for uh, supporting this research. Um, so I'm going to talk, as, as was mentioned, built environment and adaptive interventions, testing for interactions. So um, many of you are familiar with this figure, basically showing that um, over the last oh, 30 years or so, um, population level um, um, physical activity has been um, pretty um, pretty difficult to change, um, and uh, except for the last um, ten years or so, we've seen pretty much a flat trajectory. So we we have a problem, um, I think, in a deficit in our physical activity behaviors, um, and as a result of that, and also as a result of um, some of the uh, limitations of um, of interventions to help change physical activity, the field has really moved away from um, focusing only on individual level um, behavior change interventions to also taking into account the dynamic um, contextual uh, environment that people live in. Um, and so there's now pretty consistent evidence that um, our built environment, our city's designs, our city design, our walkability of neighborhoods is directly related to uh, physical activity, uh, in addition to our recreation environments. Um, and so even though there's pretty consistent correlational um, or observational evidence that physical activity and built environments are related, what's true is there are few perspective studies, only a handful, that have tested some of the ecological model tenets or principles of interactions across levels of influence. And by that I mean um, if you offer somebody a physical activity intervention and they live in a low walkable neighborhood, our expectation is that they may go out and try and be physically active, but once they interact with their environment, they may find it unsupportive of their, of their behavior change. Whereas somebody who's in a, an environment that is uh, activity friendly or walkable, if we give those same people uh, physical activity intervention, um, they, when they experience their environment, it's going to be more supportive and walkable. But even though that's been um, proposed, um, it's been tested um, very infrequently, and in fact, only a handful of studies have done that. Um, and the studies, um, this stu uh, study by Kerr, 
um, is a good example of it. So 842 uh, overweight men and women who are randomized to a 12-month intervention, exercise and diet expert system intervention, or a weight list control, who self-reported their walking time, um, their environments, their neighborhoods, after the study was complete, were geocoded to look at the walkability. And then using a median split, um, uh, compared to see how um, each group did the, um, the intervention and control. And what was interesting was that in the low walkable um, neighborhoods, those who received the intervention increased by about 29 minutes on average self-reported walking, whereas those in the high walkable neighborhood and received the intervention, they decreased their physical activity by 10 minutes. And this was kind of surprising. I was actually involved in this, in this study. Um, and we had a hard time figuring out what was going on. We speculated that maybe there was a ceiling effect, that we couldn't really change physical activity very much in those who lived in high walkable neighborhoods, although that wasn't very satisfying. And then, of course, there is um, a common limitation to many built environment studies, and that is that the range in the built environment is limited when you're only looking um, within um, a certain city or a certain area. So. Um, again, all of these studies uh, that have been done so far have looked backwards in time to see where people who are already recruited lived. And that's an, a limitation to a lot of the built environment um, research, especially looking at um, uh, cross-level interactions. So I see two challenges to testing interactions between um, behavioral interventions and built environment. One is that we need potent individual level behavioral interventions that have an effect on physical activity. Otherwise, there's really no built environment um, um, uh, effect to moderate, or there's no effect for the built environment to moderate. And then we need sufficient variability um, in neighborhood environments before we start um, introducing intervention. So we need to ensure that there's sufficient variability in order to test that, that question of interactions. So dealing with the first item, um, going back, need potent individual level interventions. About 2005 or so, I started exploring adaptive uh, interventions. And this came about because I noticed that most of the physical activity interventions tended to prescribe what I thought were stationary or static goals. Essentially, if you buy a commercial device now or if you were involved in a research intervention historically, you would get some type of goal like 10,000 steps, 8 to 10,000 steps, depending, we can argue what the right number is. Um, but uh, essentially, that would be stationary throughout um, a, an intervention. Be asked to try and attempt it at least you know, five out of seven times a week. Um, an alternative approach is to figure out what a baseline is for an individual and then ask them to add anywhere from 250 steps a day to 2,000 steps a week, slowly increasing their activity over time, which is not a bad approach. It also works. Um, but um, one of the things it doesn't consider is the dynamic life events that occur. People get sick. They get injured. Um, they have child care. Their work, their work demands increase. They travel. They have to go to school all of these things. And so I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had a more dynamic approach to goal setting, something that incorporated um, a person's activity level and was able to be more dynamic? And so I, I, I thought these goals could be called um, adaptive um, step goals or adaptive goals, where the trajectory and the speed were customized to an individual's performance. So adaptive goals for physical activity are ones that a participant can accomplish, are challenging but not overwhelming, account for these dynamic life events that I mentioned and are in the path of a target behavior, and that's how I consider them personalized. So using um, uh, basic research um, from um, uh, percentile schedules of reinforcement that, um, that have a history in behavioral psychology, um, I applied a, uh, a rank-ordered percentile approach to, uh, to goal setting. And so what does that mean? Well, if we give an, an individual a pedometer and we ask them to wear it for nine days, we can see that their activity ranges here from, um, let me go backwards here, um, from anywhere from about uh, on day nine, um, about 800 steps or so to about 6,000 steps. And if we put a moving window around that, and that's the window right there, and we rank rank order these values from lowest to highest, we now have a known range, a measured range of their behavior. And we can prescribe a goal within that range. If we were to prescribe a goal of 10,000 steps, we also know that that is outside of their range, potentially uh, not doable for them. And every participant is going to have a different baseline and a different known range. So the nice thing about this percentile approach in, in, um, is that within this known range, we can prescribe a goal 
Um, that is fairly standardized. In this case, 60th percentile, but you could use the 40th, the 70th, um, whatever, whatever would work. Um, and we asked the participant, in that case, the for, a 60th percentile here would represent a value of approximately where D, D is, or about 2,500 steps. And on the 10th day, that's what the, we prescribe for our participants. So we asked them to go out and try and do that. And of course, uh, uh, early in the intervention, participants are very motivated. Um, this individual uh, gets 10,000 steps. Great. Success. Um, we acknowledge and support that. Um, and then we uh, take that newest observation incorporate it into the moving window and drop the oldest observation and move that window over. And we, we then prescribe the next goal using the 60th percentile, which in this case moves to, to essentially the value of F. So then we prescribe that goal on the 11th day. Participant's more realistic and is able to get about 5,000 steps. Great. We do the same thing, incorporate that new information, drop the oldest observation, which in this case would be the value of B, move that window over and then prescribe the next goal. And in this case, the goal hasn't changed. It's still a 60th percentile equivalent of about the value of where F is. And if we continue to do this approach and uh, ask participants to try and accomplish the goal, what you'll see is that the goals can um, increase. They can stay the same. And as a participant starts to maybe not do so well, decrease over time. And when you look at this within a single participant over six months, you can see, uh, especially early on, how as a participant is doing well and meeting all their goals, the goals start to ramp up as they start to vacillate in their behavior, possibly because they're not psychologically or physiologically adapted to, to meet these goals. Um, they, um, the goals will start to drop down to meet them where they're at. And again, as they start to improve, the goals ramp up. And that process can happen multiple times over the course of, um, of an intervention. We've also paired these goals with um, a carrot, uh, in this case, micro-incentives, immediate micro-incentives, and contrasted that with how uh, physical activity interventions typically dole out incentives, which is for participation every month or two months or, or whatever time period, um, in order to, to try and make this an approach that can be scaled up. So um, incentives, uh, uh, catalog of incentive options that participants can change at any time over the course of the intervention. And so in a two-by-two two factorial trial, we tested this adaptive goal setting versus static goal setting and, and then immediate reward versus delayed non-contingent reward. And what we found was relative to the baseline, which is this point right here, you can see the adaptive goals end up outperforming the static goals uh, over time. And same thing with the reward type. Um, uh, immediate rewards ended up doing better than delayed rewards. And when we look at the interactions between these um, factors, you see initially that the, um, the, um, uh, the static goal group with immediate rewards ends up doing better. But over time, they end up um, uh, having a uh, downward trajectory. Whereas the adaptive goal group with immediate rewards, this blue line, they don't get as high initially. They don't um, um, uh, um, reach as high initially. And, but they end up doing better uh, over the long term. Now, why is that? I think that's because our adaptive goals are not asking people to reach for the stars. They're becoming more realistic. And uh, they're, they're prescribed uh, more realistically. And then over time, they start to ramp up as participants do better. And then, of course, the static goal group with delayed rewards, um, which I think is how many interventions have been done, ended up doing the worst and ended up uh, approximating baseline by the end of four months. So the next step we proposed was Walk It Arizona, which is a R01 funded through NCI. Um, we ended up innovating in a couple of ways. One, um, using the same approach, adaptive versus static goal setting, immediate versus financial rewards in a two-by-two two factorial trial. But instead of focusing on steps, we focused on moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes because of the, the, the closer linkages to uh, health outcomes. Um, and so interested in the main effects of each of the factors and the interactions be between factors. Um, and Walk in Arizona recruited insufficiently active adults um, between 18 and 60 years old. There was a one-year intervention phase instead of a four-month, and uh, a one-year follow-up after the interventions uh, end to see what happens uh, over time. And participants wear an Actograph GT9X watch daily, um, and they sync their, their watch um, uh, ideally daily. Um, and our main outcomes are moderate to vigorous physical activity and self-reported activity. So uh, just to give you an idea of what the back-end um, uh, computer systems look like, um, participants wear the watch. They use an existing Actograph app to sync. That um, ends up 
um, transmitting the data to the um, ActorGraphs cloud, which then notice, notifies our servers uh, at the university that there's new data waiting for a participant at any hour, any time of day. We then process that um, data, figure out whether um, the participant met their goal or not, whether um, points for, um, for uh, accomplishing their goal should be um, handed out or not, um, and then uh, uh, text back that feedback. Um, congratulations, you met, you, know, you met your goal of 13 minutes. Um, re reward points equals 100. Your next goal is 17 minutes, for example. And so this happens for all the groups, and the, the logic changes depending on the group assignment. We also expanded our reward catalog. We partnered with a company called Tango to include a, a, a larger catalog of rewards to attract more people, um, and also um, allowed us to essentially, at any time, at any moment, um, be able to send an electronic gift card um, for pretty much any denomination. And you can see there's a, a variety of gift cards available. I personally like Sephora. I think that's a great one um, to, to recruit. Um, and also um, GameStop, as um, you know, we have different target audiences. What was novel, though, I think, about Walk in Arizona, tying it back to the, the, um, my introduction, was that we, before the study started, used geographic information systems to calculate walkability at the block group level for, um, for the entire uh, Maricopa County area. And so what we did was identify those areas that were higher walkable and lower walkable. And those areas that were kind of moderately walkable, we ended up ignoring because we really wanted to get the extremes in terms of walkability in order, since this is not a variable we can randomize exposures to, we wanted um, to, to get um, high and low um, walkability. And then we also looked at, um, cross, we cross-stratified these uh, by income level, so higher and lower income, in order to identify neighborhoods that were high walkable, higher income, high walkable, lower income, lower walkable, uh, low, low walkable, lower income, and low walkable, higher income. So this is a conceptualization of the study design. Essentially, we have a factorial design nested within an observational design. And what we can do is um, we, can ask, we can ask and answer the question about the interventions and the components of the interventions by pooling um, the cells together, all the, um, say, all of one type of group. Um, but we can also start to look at interactions between these um, factors with the, the neighborhood walkability. So we can ask, do adaptive goals work better than static goals? And we can ask, do adaptive goals work better than static goals in lower versus higher walkable neighborhoods? Um, and same thing for the immediate rewards. And we can, of course, do it for socioeconomic status. So we live in Phoenix. We are doing our study in Phoenix. We have over 100 days with temps over 100 degrees, sometimes as high as 122 degrees. Um, people tend to ask, well, doesn't that impact activity? Yes, it does. Um, so what we have done is recruited a balanced sample across every calendar month. And, of course, we have a one-year intervention. So anybody who starts in June or July ends in June or July. Um, and we also looked at uh, a more precise estimate of walkability by geocoding participants' homes. And then around their homes, um, figured out the different, uh, quantified the different components of walkability to come up with a walkability score for each participant's uh, around each participant's home at 500 meters through the street network. We did that for every type of neighborhood. You can see this kind of offers some face validity to um, what, we, what our results are in terms of walkability. So preliminary results. Walk at Arizona is an ongoing uh, trial. We, are, uh, we just uh, completed recruiting our last participant back in May. So the results, um, uh, I tried to match up to four months, which was earlier, uh, I presented earlier. And so unadjusted means, so we have four different physical activity interventions. You could think about them as maybe higher or lower intensity. But every, um, every group increased their physical activity. Interestingly, the, the um, adaptive goal group did better than the static goal group by about 2.7 minutes. And the immediate reward group did better than the delayed non-contingent reward group by about five minutes or so. And these are unadjusted means. And I should mention that um, the data yield about, about 51,000 observations or so. When we look at the interaction, though, now between goal type and walkability, and consider walkability is a continuous score, so we're looking at the 25th and 75th percentiles of snapshots, you can see the adaptive goal group did better in the lower walkable neighborhoods than the static goal group. And that was true. Um, um, the, the adaptive goal group did better, um, even more so than in the higher walkable neighborhoods, 
where the difference for adaptive goal group was only about a minute or so um, uh, compared to static goal group. For the reward type by walkability interaction, we saw something quite what we would expect. Um, in the lower walkable group, we saw an interaction where um, uh, the, higher, uh, the immediate reward group um, in the lower walkable neighborhoods um, increased by about 1.6 minutes a, a day. And in the higher walkable neighborhoods, immediate reward group increased by about, um, about fi uh, five minutes a day. So across several studies and samples, uh, we, we, and I didn't present all of them, but there are about four studies that um, we've conducted looking at adaptive goals. Adaptive goals outperform static goals, and immediate financial rewards outperform delayed non-contingent rewards for both steps and moderate to vigorous physical activity. Our preliminary walk at Arizona results suggest that adaptive goal and immediate reward interventions function differently by levels of walkability. Unexpectedly, adaptive goals were more salient in lower walkable than higher walkable neighborhoods. So this may suggest an alternative approach to overcoming activity unsupportive environments. It's possible. We're going to have to see how things play out. But at least in the first four months, that seems to be fairly true. Um, as expected, immediate rewards were more salient in higher walkable neighborhoods. But interestingly, delayed rewards were least effective in higher walkable neighborhoods as compared to lower walkable neighborhoods. This is a no novel finding, I think. Um, that, uh, considering that most walkability studies are cross-sectional that include both active in, and insufficiently active samples. So our group, our participants uh, were, recruited to be, uh, were recruited to be insufficiently uh, active, and that's true. So I guess it kind of it begs the question, is there something unique about um, insufficiently active adults who already live in a high walkable neighborhood? We would expect them to be more physically active um, and, and uh, than, they, than they are, and when they get out and uh, are active, we would expect that to somehow uh, interact with our, our physical activity interventions. So a question um, that has occurred to me is, is there something going on that maybe these people are entrenched a little bit, those who live in higher walkable neighborhoods um, who are insufficiently active, and do they need a greater stimulus, a motivational stimulus, to get them out and about? And that would maybe explain what we're seeing with the immediate financial reward. Whereas those who live in a lower walkable neighborhood, anything is helping them get out um, um, and be a little bit more active. And that's consistent with the Kerr study, although it's in contrast to what we would expect from ecological models. And I have a thought or two about that that just recently occurred to me. So this is an ongoing study. We need to uh, wait to answer these questions about physical activity adoption. This is about adoption at this point. Um, and more importantly, we're interested in how uh, walkability impacts moderate to vigorous physical activity once treatments are removed, essentially maintenance, because that's um, a core uh, question that we're interested in. So um, again, I just wanted to say thank you. And from my co-investigators um, uh, and I and postdoc and, and doctoral student who's now looking for a job, thank you. Hi, Lene Med from NCCIH. That was a really interesting talk, and uh, I really like this idea about adaptive goal setting within uh, this intervention. My question is on adherence. I'm actually really impressed that you have a, a full year intervention period, and I'm wondering um, about the adherence of your participants and whether you saw any differences in adherence between <laughs> your four conditions, and perhaps, you know, are people more likely to stay in? And active in the intervention uh, if they have that immediate um, incentive and, and if they have adaptive goals or yeah. what you see from your data? So that's a hard question to answer because we're still in the middle of the study. Yeah. And so our numbers are constantly, you know, sort of moving, especially since um, certain neighborhoods were harder to recruit than other neighborhoods. And so when are kind of looking across groups or across neighborhoods, it's a little bit more difficult. And of course, there was about a two-year recruitment period um, to, to do that. Um, but our early look at it, um, and, and it's not about dropout, it was just in terms of adherence to wearing the watch, was that there was fairly good adherence in terms of about 70% to 80% of the time that they're wearing the watch, which I think over a one-year period is a pretty good adherence rate. Um, and we weren't seeing huge differences. But again, this is an ongoing study, and we don't 
you know, about half of our sample has finally finished the, the one-year intervention phase, so we're still waiting for the other half to complete. It's actually good that you don't see differences because you'll actually be able to compare <laughs> the different conditions better than. Yeah, but we do really adjust for wear time yeah. in the models, so that, that kind of speaks to that um, yes. also because there could be also a difference in how much someone wears the device even if they are wearing it. Yeah. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. I just wonder if you take into account the geopolitical situation, like uh, the slope of the low or something like that, different kind of geographical condition. And second is whether you have taken into account of some other situation that maybe they got a traffic ticket or something, special circumstances. Um, I didn't catch the first part of your question, which was about a slope. Like, like geographical condition, the like weather or the slope of the, the road. The, oh, the, the a, a weather or slope of the road. Um, uh, we we, we did, do not have slope of road, um, but we tend to be a pretty flat county, um, being in Arizona and being a, in a desert. Um, so, so I'm... Um, we, we could take a look at that. I think we might be able to, to uh, obtain weather, data on, on slope, but unlike like San Francisco, um, for example, where they would be much more slopey than us, um, we, 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 we haven't looked at that yeah. uh, yet. How about temperature or something like that? Well, temperature, um, <coughs> temperature we have looked at, actually, and we're up, um, um, Christy Phillips, a postdoc, is looking at time-varying effect models and, and temperature and, and, um, and other weather conditions. Um, and also, um, we're starting to explore uh, sky view factor um, and, and weather, uh, and, and sorry, and UV exposure, um, and neighborhood UV exposure, and how that may, may influence um, someone's activity over time. Mm -hmm. Any circumstances about family or traffic? Uh, Maybe they got a traffic ticket or something? Uh, we don't have traffic ticket, but I'm pleased to say we do have um, survey information, a pretty comprehensive survey on crime, um, and, um, and also um, um, uh, we also have information, self-report information on um, traffic, um, perceived safety from traffic, but we don't have uh, traffic ticket information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks for uh, inviting me here to talk about our work. Thank you, Lana Shechem from NIDCD for nominating us to, to be here and talk about this. Um, all of the uh, work that I'm going to talk to you about has been funded by the NIDCD. Uh, so most of you probably don't spend much time looking at the vocal fold, so I want to just orient you to the part of the body that I'm going to be discussing um, you know, of course, the vocal folds are right in your throat, right about, about the top of your airway. They close when you swallow to protect your airway, and they open while you're breathing. Um, and then you close them and force air up from your lungs to kind of explode them open with pressure, and they suck back shut. And that self-sustained oscillation is what we call voice when we talk. Um, also, just to give you an idea of, you know, what it looks like, too, uh, these are all bird's eye views of the vocal folds. So a camera goes up the nose and either looks down at the vocals, vocal folds from above that way, or a camera goes to the back of the mouth and looks at the vocal folds from the bird's eye view there. Um, and this is what normal vocal folds look like and sound like, if there was sound. But sound's not necessarily as important, but vocal folds... Uh, when they're normal, uh, they, they touch right here while you're phonating. This is a zone where you get a lot of contact, and her voice sounds normal. Uh, there's also nice straight edges here. Um, but uh, there's many disorders that affect the vocal folds themselves. Um, and in fact, at any point in time, 3 to 9% of the population has a voice disorder. And up to 50% of people at some point in time uh, are estimated to have experienced a voice disorder at some point in time in their life. Um, most voice disorders that we treat in the clinic are believed to be caused by how people use their voice in daily life, so their vocal behavior in daily life. And um, in order to assess how people are using their voice in daily life, 
we've developed a lot of different ambulatory monitors that record what the voice is doing and uh, provided biofeedback capabilities to these ambulatory monitors so that we can reinforce and uh, extend whatever therapy, behavior change techniques, and, and different voicing behaviors we're requesting in the voice therapy session, extending it outside into the patient's daily life. Um, an example of one of the most common behaviorally based voice disorders are these vocal fold nodules right here. You can see that there's two callus-like lesions. They happen right at the spot of the vocal folds where when you phonate, there's a maximum area of um, contact where there's probably the most collision. And the result of inefficient voicing or having a lot of collision force at these areas creates these calluses that can make it very difficult to voice. Um, and we believe that these calluses are formed by how people use their voice in daily life in an inefficient way that caused trauma there repeatedly over time. So um, the other thing about the behavior and how important the behavior is, since we think it's the cause of the disorder, uh, a surgeon can go in and remove these lesions. But if the behavior that caused them isn't remediated or changed, then these lesions will recur. So before we started looking into ambulatory voice biofeedback, I want to give you a little bit of an information about what the current state was. So there's lots of ambulatory monitors, all five in particular, that have been commercially available or used in research, and all of them have been limited to giving feedback on the patient's pitch, what note they're hitting while they're talking, or loudness, how loud they're talking. Um, and these are um, occasionally very useful for specific stereotypical patients, but they're not broadly applicable because in general in voice therapy, we're asking people to change their behavior to be something more efficient or less traumatic, not necessarily just louder or at a different pitch. Um, also, biofeedback was relatively simple. Uh, for our purposes in this talk, I'll say whenever somebody talked too loud, we cued them um, immediately. So 100% of the time when they talk too loud, we gave them a cue, because that's all we could do at the time. Um, and there weren't very many studies that looked at ambulatory voice biofeedback. The few that were out at the time were case studies, and the results were inconsistent. Sometimes patients changed their behavior uh, when they got the biofeedback, and sometimes they did not. Um, and there was no consistent data on what happened when we removed the biofeedback, uh, which is very important because the overall goal of uh, voice therapy is a permanently changed vocal behavior. It has to be learned or it has to be prevalent or it has to be there after we turn the feedback off. It's not dependent just on being there when we give them feedback. So at that point in time, no one had really convincingly demonstrated the potential clinical value of ambulatory voice biofeedback. So I just want to tell you about the paradigm we use to assess learning. It's a dichotomy between performance or acquisition and learning, where performance is the temporary change in behavior that's present during feedback or practice. Um, and you can see here in this example, there's two groups practicing something over time on the x-axis. And as they practice, they decrease their error on the y-axis um, so they get more accurate at what they're doing. One group is getting feedback every time they do something on how accurate it was. That's the gray group. And the black group is getting feedback every other time they do something. Um, so the different frequencies of feedback will be important for learning. Learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior present after the feedback is removed or after some time when you have not practiced. Um, so here you can see in this study, a few hours after they're done practicing, when they're not getting any feedback, both groups had a slight decrement showing how much they kind of had short-term learning, uh, but they both seem to be performing about the same. But if you look a few days later, in general, the group that got less frequent feedback usually learns better and has less performance decrement. And this is no longer really called a motor learning theory, but a motor learning principle that as you in general decrease how much feedback you give, um, it's gonna have more benefits for, for longer-term learning. Um, and you can also do this through um, summary feedback or delayed feedback. So instead of giving feedback on every fifth trial, which would be reduced frequency of feedback, you can give the patient all five trials and show them how they did on all five or give them an average of how they did. 
Now, we wanted to do a preliminary study since there was so little done in this area when we started, and we used a device that was available at the time. It was a large device that you would fit in a fanny pack called the ambulatory phonation monitor. Uh, we use an accelerometer that you attach to the anterior neck skin, which records your voice when it's, vi when it's vibrating, the neck skin. And um, if they spoke too loudly, we would give them a buzz on a pager vibrator. So our questions were, if we gave people biofeedback in daily life, would they even change their behavior? And if they did, would that behavior be retained once we removed the biofeedback? And so we had six participants with normal voices. We chose people with normal voices at first because we wanted to look at how people were learning to change their vocal behavior without a confound of doing it in the presence of a pathology, which would make it even more difficult. And we did three baseline days to get an individualized biofeedback threshold per person. And um, the threshold was to cue them every time they were in their loudest 30 percentile, 30th percentile of loudness. So when they were above 70% uh, or higher in their loudness, we would cue them and tell them they were too loud. Um, there were four days in the experiment where we withdrew and gave feedback, A, B, A, B design, where A days were biofeedback days and B days were post-biofeedback days. So this is pretty much the results where the left y-axis represents the black line, the right y-axis represents the gray line, and the three uh, categories of baseline days, biofeedback days and post-biofeedback days. And what you can see is that there was only a biofeedback effect and that the patients, or at least patient subjects, uh, spoke significantly softer, they reduced their loudness by five decibels on average, and were more compliant only during the biofeedback days. Uh, they, went, they were about 85% of the time they were not loud when they were being given biofeedback. Um, and this effect washed out once we removed the biofeedback. So it was interesting that there was a biofeedback effect in changing their behavior, but this behavior was not, uh, uh, it was a relatively quickly lost uh, new behavior. So we wanted to start giving more sophisticated biofeedback based on some motor learning principles. And we were already developing the Voice Health Monitor, which is an app on a smartphone, Android app on a smartphone. And it can record the raw neck skin waveform for a whole week. And we can periodically check in with patients uh, or control or subjects on how are they doing throughout the day with their voice or anything odd happening in your daily life. Um, we implemented real-time voice activity detection so that we can tell when people are voicing or not automatically, the app can, and then provided bio, uh, made biofeedback settings that wouldn't just give feedback when you did something wrong, we could uh, provide more sophisticated things like reduce the frequency of feedback. So we would give you feedback every second time you did it incorrectly or every fourth time or every fifth time you know, reducing our frequency of feedback from 100 down to 25% to 20%. Um, and we could also give summary feedback, which I'll show you how we did the summary feedback um, in the next slide. And we incorporated a smartwatch so that it would have improved user interaction. So summary feedback was a little bit more complicated on how to provide it. Um, how we chose to do it was giving people uh, feedback every two minutes of voicing time. So that took anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes throughout the course of the day, depended on how much somebody talked. Uh, if they talked more, then they would get cued, they'd get their summary statistics in a shorter amount of time. And um, the statistics would come up, and uh, it says swipe right to left. This was before Tinder, so it should just be swipe left. Um, but, um, you know, then you'll have your summary statistics show up, and this patient or subject, 95% of the time they were not loud for the last two minutes of voicing. Um, and then we wanted to make sure, since they were in the field and we could not observe them, that they observed and understood the number that they got. Um, so they were given two random numbers and their number, and they had to guess, well, they didn't have to guess, but they had to you know, select their number to pass on to the next summary statistic, which was for the entire day up till then, which this person was 91% of the time, they were not loud. And they had to pick their right number. If they selected the wrong one, then they would be stuck in this loop till they got it right. 
So our study design was we wanted to do a group-based evaluation of three groups of subjects who got different biofeedback uh, approaches. Uh, they were block randomized into either getting feedback every time they were too loud, 100% cueing, or every fourth time they were too loud, 25% cueing, or no cueing at all throughout the day, at least not with a vibrotactile stimulus, just summary statistics every two minutes of voicing time. Uh, there were three baseline days per subject so that we could get the subject's individualized biofeedback threshold. And for this study, we chose their 85th percentile of loudness. So every time they went into their upper 15% of their loudest loud, they would get cued or every fourth time or get summary on how much the time. They were not above their 85th percentile. Um, they got one day of biofeedback, and then we monitored them two more times for short and long-term retention. They did not get biofeedback during these last two days. Um, and we used some conventional statistics from the motor learning literature where they, te they tended to do mixed ANOVAs, repeated measure between group ANOVAs for acquisition, um, and then separate one-way ANOVAs for short and long-term retention, which we did one one-way ANOVA for each retention period. That was just the raw percent compliance values, how much of the time they not go above the threshold. And then we also did performance change scores. So how much of a decrement did they have from their biofeedback uh, performance? We chose um, a cohort of ICU nurses because we still wanted to look at the motor learning effects without the pathology being present. Uh, but we needed to find a group of people who were intrinsically motivated to not talk loud, um, even though they had a normal voice. And in the ICUs, how loud nurses talk uh, can disrupt critically ill patients trying to recover. Uh, background noise in ICUs is a problem. And so the most controllable aspect of that is how loud nurses talk. So we partnered up with a Mass General Quality Improvement Program, and all the people in this study were ICU nurses. So these are the results of the study, and the y-axis is percent compliance, how much of the time that they were monitored they were not loud. Um, and right now that's showing uh, the three baseline days, which are stable because we used those to pick the nurse's 85th percentile that was individual to them. And then we gave the three groups biofeedback for a day, and all three groups significantly increased their percentage compliance. All three groups of nurses did not talk loud in the ICUs, 97% um, of the monitoring time. If we looked one to two days later, the group that got the most feedback, the 100% feedback group, per kind of the motor learning uh, literature, would suggest that they started decaying the fastest in their performance and seemed to have had the least permanent behavior change. Uh, the summary feedback group seemed to do the best, um, and they were significantly different than the 100% feedback group. And the difference was about four percentage points between summary and 100%. And this difference between those two groups got even larger uh, a week later with the 100% feedback group, almost a lot of them reverting back to their baseline behavior of talking loud frequently in the ICUs. So it looks as though feedback frequency and timing do affect retention. And where this is more novel than maybe some other motor learning uh, studies is that this was done in a real-life environment uh, with people going about their real-life activities, uh, uh, not in a laboratory highly controlled. Um, in fact, the 100% feedback group seemed to learn less than the other groups, which replicates a lot of the motor control, motor learning literature. It was approximately four to five percentage points of difference, which can be uh, looked at as two and a half to three minutes of phonation time. And the question always for me as a, as a clinician, is this a clinically meaningful difference if I saw this in patients? Well, every time the vocal folds oscillate, they collide. And these behaviorally based voice disorders a lot of times are based on these collisions. Um, most of these subjects were female, and an average female voice phonates at about 200 hertz. So about 200 times per second, their vocal folds run into each other. And if we multiply that by three minutes, uh, this difference is about 36,000 vocal fold collisions, which seems like it would be clinically meaningful if we saw this in a patient cohort, um, especially even more plausible since at the loudest loud levels is where you have more trauma than at comfortable or soft. 
Also, we've been uh, doing this with patients as well lately, the same exact uh, experimental design, um, and also some patients just as, uh, as part of voice therapy. And some of what they say has caused us to think more broadly than just the motor skill uh, literature. Uh, a lot of their comments have to do with self-regulatory processes. Um, so if we ask people about what they went through when they were getting biofeedback, it makes us wonder, if we fade cues, are we fading cues in an ambulatory way uh, as the subject's improving their vocal motor skill? Or are we kind of increasing the challenge level for self-regulation? Because you don't need as, if you don't get as many cues, you have to rely on yourself more. Um, and some patient comments are, you know, I felt more aware of how loud I was. I didn't necessarily change my voice, just became more sensitive to how loud I was talking. And I realized I was loud and the biofeedback didn't buzz me when it should have. This was somebody who was getting 100% feedback and was transferred to summary feedback. Uh, so they um, independently recognize this. And also they, they tend to bring up a lot of connections between their vocal behavior and their ability to express emotion. Um, so one patient said, I thought I was not going to be able to show emotions or expressions in my voice without getting loud, but it was fine. And another one said they no longer equate being loud with expressing excitement or needing to be loud to be taken seriously or have an impact in conversation. What's really interesting about all of this stuff for me is these are things that we educate patients about in voice therapy, um, but they don't actually carry them out in daily life. But when they're being buzzed in their daily life and they have to figure it out, these things become self-evident to the patient. Uh, right now, what we're doing is we're testing various types of feedback in a very controlled way in patients with vocal fold nodules to see if this finding will replicate itself in, um, in the patient population. And we're also looking into more physiologically salient objective measures, both those related to the voice. Um, if we look at how the flow exits the vocal folds when they open and close, uh, there's some aspects of a flow waveform that can give us more insight into the, the trauma that's happening each time the vocal folds collide. Um, that's what this graph is. Also, we can transform the accelerometer signal into an estimate of how much pressure people are using to start their voice and to phonate. Usually, the more pressure you have to use, the more, uh, more effort you're using or the more, um, the more uh, collision you're using. Um, in addition to this, we're also using machine learning techniques and ambulatory data to help us understand what's different between the patients and the controls. Um, and then we're also monitoring um, uh, ambulatory EDA GSR uh, with an E4 Empatica device at the same time as monitoring the voice to see if there's any um, autonomic arousal uh, connections with how voicing is happening in between patients and controls as well. And these are everyone that was involved in making this uh, possible. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, two major questions. One is, uh, do, do you take into account their disease or illness, like a cold or allergy, something there was like one, that? So, there was one uh, nurse who got a cold in the middle of the protocol, and she had to drop out. Uh, but we didn't have any other people come down with any illnesses during the study. We also screened all the nurses for that study. Uh, we looked at their vocal folds and made sure they looked pristine and normal. If they, there were nine nurses who had actually vocal fold nodules that were excluded from the study. And second is for ICU patients. And I heard, I heard a, a case like this. The, the patients is kind of normal, but somehow sent to the hospital and they give him a, a urinary catheter, is it? And it got some bleeding, and it then lost the voice. And it then the, the hospital gave him some kind of equipment, and so they want to see something inside the throat. But after that, lost all the voice. So 
I don't know if you address these issues or in your future research, would you take into these kind of cases to study? Well, you know, with cases like that, there's, there's so many factors that could be at play. You know, I'd have, to, I'd have to know a little bit more of the specifics of the patient and things like that to, to comment on what could have happened or what, what could be studied with that. But, um, you know, sounds interesting. Thank you. Very interesting presentation, given that your sample were healthy people at first. Um, is there application to people who've um, either as a, from treatment, say cancer treatment, like radiation treatment, I'm thinking of thyroid cancer, or surgery would have application for this type of therapy? So um, there are some people who have some voicing difficulties after, you know, radiation to the larynx and, and uh, long-term radiation effects. Um, and so if we could find a, a measure that was physiologically salient and made sense as to why they were having voice problems, despite, you know, just the natural process, um, then we could use these types of feedback approaches with that more, with that patient or a cohort specific feature. Does that make sense? Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you for holding it out for the last talk of the afternoon. Uh, it certainly, it's been a great privilege to be invited here to share our uh, findings. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the NIH for funding us, and NIAMS was part of a P60 grant, and uh, thanks to our program officer, James uh, Witter, for nominating us. So I'll mention that I'm a rheumatologist, I'm a physician, uh, so I wanted to tell you a bit about uh, our disease of interest in our uh, lab, which is rheumatoid arthritis. There's obviously many kinds of arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a particularly interesting one, I think. Um, so it's a chronic systemic inflammatory autoimmune disease. Uh, it's typically characterized by painful swollen joints, usually the small joints of the hands, wrists, and feet. Uh, it's the most common systemic rheumatic disease. It affects nearly 1% of adults, over 2 million people in the U.S., and it disproportionately affects women. Um, there's known long-term consequences of joint destruction, chronic pain, and disability. You can see some common features here uh, where the hands are really deformed and have uh, uh, issues with disability. Um, so there's some known risk factors. And actually, most of what our uh, group looks at are uh, trying to understand why people develop rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so in particular, there's a genetic factor called the shared epitope in the HLA region, which is an immune region. Um, and it's the strongest genetic risk factor for RA. And then there's also some autoantibodies that are present uh, at diagnosis, one called rheumatoid factor, or RF, another called cyclic citronide peptide, or CCP. Um, and these are used in the clinic, and they're present in about 70% of patients with RA. And what our group and others have found is that if these antibodies are present in the serum, um, within five years, about 50% progress to clinical RA. So there are patients that or people that have these in their blood but don't actually have the syndrome yet. The other thing that our group looks at is uh, looking for um, environmental or lifestyle risk factors for developing rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so I won't delve into all the literature here, but we've written a lot of these papers. In particular, smoking increases your risk of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there's actually some protective factors. Um, increasing alcohol intake may decrease rheumatoid arthritis risk <clears throat> due to the anti-inflammatory effects. Um, fish intake might decrease the risk due to omega-3 intake, and other healthy dietary items might uh, decrease risk as well. Of course, there are some dietary factors that increase risk, including sugar-sweetened soda, red meat intake, an unhealthy or an inflammatory dietary pattern. Most of the things that taste good aren't actually good for your body. Um, and then a lot of the other usual suspects, physical inactivity, overweight, overweight and obesity, all increase uh, risk for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and interestingly, poor dental hygiene might increase risk for rheumatoid arthritis. I won't go into the background of it, but uh, the typical causative pathogen for periodontitis, Porphyromonas gingivalis, might express an enzyme which makes your body more likely to citrullinate proteins and to form that citrullinated cyclic uh, protein antibody. 
So really, we've, we've learned a lot about why RA develops, um, and it's really genetics. There's biomarkers and there's behaviors. Um, and some of our other work has incorporated prediction models to identify groups at very elevated risk. Um, just walk you through this picture. This might look kind of silly to you guys, but as rheumatologists, we think that the uh, small joints in the, of the hands and feet are really the most important because that's where RA um, uh, presents. So these are homunculi that are sort of an exaggerated uh, version of the joints. And so you can see the phase A here is a person with a genetic risk factor, like that shared epitope. Here that homunculus turns into a smoker that might be an environmental risk factor, uh, which might in turn cause the antibody to form, so the homunculus is now an antibody. And then symptoms develop in the small joints that are nonspecific. There might be a period of undifferentiated arthritis prior to sort of full-blown rheumatoid arthritis, which has many swollen, uh, painful joints. So uh, there's a thought that behavior change may delay or prevent RA. Um, so we started to wonder, are we able to uh, integrate these disparate risk factors to try to actually change behavior? Because the antibodies don't go away. Obviously, we can't change genetics, uh, sex, and age, and all those other risk factors. Uh, so we did look at the literature to see whether some of these, um, uh, whether personalized medicine can actually encourage people to change behaviors. So this was an interesting meta-analysis looking at personalized uh, uh, genetic disclosure and whether it motivated improvements in dietary behaviors. Uh, so this is a meta-analysis of, I think, uh, seven studies here. You can see that none of the studies by themselves are positive, but overall there was a positive effect that telling, just telling someone their genetic risk did motivate improvements in dietary behaviors. So our real research question for this study was, does disclosure of personalized RA risk increase motivation to change RA risk-related behaviors. Um, so we use the trans-theoretical model, and you have to forgive me, I'm not a behavior scientist. Most of what I do is epidemiologic and patient-oriented research. I understand there are other competing models, but the trans-theoretical model, um, really patients or people start in pre-contemplation, and they have a complex movement of into contemplation, determination, relapse, maintenance, action, termination, and obviously there's many cycles here before as far as temporary behavior change, um, and regression backwards. But one tenet is, obviously, if you wanted to s tell someone to change a behavior, they have to know what that behavior is and why it's important. So it's really necessary to educate about RA risk factors before any behavior change can occur. Uh, so here's the study schematic of our study. Um, it was called the Personalized Risk Estimator for RA, or Pre-RA Family Study. And this is really a personalized medicine randomized control trial. And what we did was uh, recruited first degree relatives without RA, um, and then we um, surveyed them uh, baseline and throughout the follow-up, and we randomized them to three different education strategies, which I'll walk through uh, oh, uh, later as well. The first was a comparison arm, which was, had 80 subjects. So these people sort of got standard education about RA um, without any personalized disclosure of uh, their own risk. The second arm, called the pre-RA arm, um, received that same RA education, but also received a web-based personalized risk estimator for RA tool that we called pre-RA, and I'll walk you through later. But basically a website that integrated all of their RA risk factors into summary scores. Um, and then there's the pre-RA plus arm, um, which had 80 subjects randomized. They also received RA education as well as the website, and also received an education, one-on-one uh, um, -on -one session with a health educator to sort of really go through the results. And we collected um, uh, outcomes on motivation to change RA risk behaviors at four time points um, post-intervention, one immediately, six weeks, and six months, as well as one year. For our primary analysis, we uh, actually put both of the pre-RA groups into a single group, given that these had all received personalized risk disclosure. So our inclusion-exclusion criteria are here. Um, as I think I really talked about before, they had to be a first-degree blood relative, so they either had to have a parent, a sibling, or child with rheumatoid arthritis. We did recruit their own clinics, so we did know that the patients actually had rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they had to be an adult, 18 to 70. They could not have already have RA or another similar disease, and they had a joint exam, which confirmed that. This was performed only at our center. Before, and recruitment was between 2013 and 2016. And again, the main method of recruitment was through the patients. We did also recruit through the Arthritis Foundation and online postings. So a bit more about the education strategies. The first was a non-personalized education uh, with a one-on-one -on -one interactive lecture that we called the comparison arm. So these uh, little icons here show you about the um, 
materials they got, as well as the one-on-one -on -one interactive le uh, uh, lecture. The pre-RA arm, symbolized here by the laptop here, um, received the pre-RA web tool, which I'll take you through an example in a moment. And then the pre-RA plus arm received everything that the prior two arms received, as well as a one-on-one -on -one session with the health educator. And the summary materials were given to participants in all arms. Uh, there was also a booster session in all arms six months after the initial education. Uh, I'll mention that the measures at the six-month time point occurred prior to that booster session. Uh, so the comparison arm received standard non-personalized education about epidemiology, symptoms, diagnosis. This lasted about 10 to 20 minutes. It was one-on-one, -on -one and there was time for questions as well. This was with a trained research assistant. Uh, so now I'll walk you through the uh, website. So this was modeled off of uh, your disease risk, which is something you could Google, and it tells you your personalized risk for many different cancers, osteoporosis, coronary heart disease. Um, ours was modified by including biomarkers, genetics, and these antibodies. So basically, the uh, subjects input their own uh, data here related to height, weight, family history, uh, et cetera. Um, and then we also had already previously measured their genetics and autoantibodies at a previous uh, baseline visit. Uh, so these were input by research assistants, but there were also summary uh, slides about what their genetic risk was. So on the left here, you can see your genetic risk. This one says you have a genetic marker. I'll mention that the genetic marker here, the shared epitope, while it increases risk, it, it's present in about 20% of the populations, and certainly not that many people develop RA, so it's really a, not a deterministic gene. On the right is your autoantibody profile. Um, your blood, this, this is an example of did not finding it. Um, so again, these are uncommon in the general population. They're present in about 1% to 2% of people, so, but if, if it is present, you're at very high risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. So really, this pre-RA risk calculator, uh, which we had previously developed, um, was uh, fairly broad as far as all the uh, different data that's integrated into this risk calculator. Um, so there were demographic information, family history, again, the genetic, the autoantibodies, and we're terming all these as non-modifiable. And really what the, the intervention was focused on is, are people able to modify these factors, uh, smoking, obesity, dental health, and fish intake? And we have nice little icons here for you to keep track. Um, so here's what we, um, uh, part of the summary score, we call this our thermometer, thermometer, which is really sort of a relative risk here. Um, so subjects had this risk that was, you can see here, this is where their risk is based on their behaviors, genetics, demographics, autoantibodies. This one says you're at above average for RA relatives. You can see that there's levels here, so there's sort of a, uh, um, you can see it go up and down. And then here on the right, it's sort of, a, I guess, the counterfactual, if you would. What would happen to my risk if, if I quit smoking, if I maintained a healthy weight, if I ate more fish? So people could click here and toggle back and forth, and they had a lot of fun with this. But you could see that this person, if they maintained a healthy lifestyle, could go from above average to below average. Uh, we also, for the numerically inclined, we gave subjects their actual lifetime risk of RA, um, given these pictograms here. Um, and again, this is integrated to all their personalized uh, risk information, including genetics and autoantibodies. So this one says, out of 100 women just like you, 15 will develop RA in their lifetime, 85 will not. The pre-RA plus arm received these measures as well as one-on-one -on -one session with a health educator who interpreted the results, provided counseling, and used motivational interviewing techniques, which lasted 10 to 20 minutes. So for instance, if a patient or a subject didn't smoke, they really wouldn't talk much about smoking because it wasn't relative to them. They would sort of delve into you know, bar barriers and facilitators for sort of adopting a healthy lifestyle, and also talk about what the genetics and autoantibodies really meant for them. So our outcome measure was uh, uh, contemplation ladders. Um, so the, again, we had four separate contemplation ladders uh, smoking, which has a validated ladder, but the other ones really didn't have ladders developed yet. So we had to develop ladders for exercise, diet, and dental health. Basically, each rung on the ladder corresponds to different stages in the trans theoretical model. Um, so pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And anything that goes upward is sort of an increased motivation to change. And our primary composite outcome was a composite of any increase in any four of the ladders that follow up compared to baseline. Um, our statistical analysis, we again prefer, compared the pre-RA group to comparison arm. We used generalized estimating uh, equations to obtain the relative risk over the three post-intervention time points. We also looked at um, all three of the groups. 
Uh, and then we also looked at self-reported behavior change at post-intervention time points. Uh, so here's the baseline characteristics. And again, there were 238 subjects. Um, average age was in the mid-40s. Most were female, most were white, most were very educated. Not many smokers. Um, they were right in the overweight range. Um, here's the uh, flow diagram for our uh, recruitment. I won't go through all the numbers here, um, but you can see that uh, there were 238 randomized and there were 213 assessed at the six-month uh, visit. So there, there was pretty reasonable, strong follow-up. Uh, so here are the overall results for our primary intention to treat analysis. Um, so the blue bar is the comparison arm. The red bar is the pre-RA group. On the y-axis is the increased motivation to change behaviors from baseline, which is the primary composite outcome in the media six weeks and six months. You can see that the red bar is taller at all time points, and uh, somewhat reassuringly, there was no real degradation over time. In fact, the, the largest delta was at the six-month time point. And there was a statistically significant difference with a 23% increased motivation to improve behaviors in the pre-RA group compared to the comparison arm. So here's a, a secondary uh, intention to treat analysis um, where we defined RA risk as high or low, and we, we looked at high or low based on whether we told them they had genetics, whether they had the autoantibody, or whether they're above the uh, median lifetime risk for RA. And we actually told 77 people that they were at high risk based on a composite of those three measures. Um, and then there were 75 people that didn't have any of those measures. And so we kind of wondered, are the high-risk people going to feel so uh, compelled that they're going to get this, that they're you know, going to ad adopt a, an unhealthy lifestyle? And conversely, are people at low risk that are reassured maybe going to adopt an unhealthy lifestyle? So you, could, you can make a case for this going even be even worse than the comparison arm. And again, I think reassuringly, we didn't see that. So actually, we saw the most motivation to change behavior in the high-lifetime RA risk group with a 35% increased risk. And there was really no... Um, difference in the low lifetime risk group, um, but at least it wasn't worse than the comparison arm, so we didn't really inflict concern um, or inflict an unhealthy lifestyle on these uh, people. Um, we also did a secondary analysis looking at self-reported behavior change at six months. Um, you can see here the red bars uh, increased self-reported behaviors really across the board except for increased physical activity, which everyone wanted to do. Um, smoking cessation, there weren't many smokers here. Um, actually, none of the uh, people in the comparison arm quit, whereas five out of eight quit in the pre-RA arm, which we thought was reassuring, um, although this did not reach statistical significance. Uh, we also did a secondary analysis looking at knowledge score to see whether people actually retained what we were telling them and whether they knew what the risk factors were. And these were people that had relatives with rheumatoid arthritis. So we created a, a score called the RA knowledge score, which integrated eight known RA risk factors you can see at the baseline, it was you know, about 50%. People got about four out of eight right. And you can see that both of the pre-RA arms um, increased their knowledge of RA really over time compared to the comparison arm, which just increased a little bit. Sorry that the PowerPoint uh, format is off a bit. Um, so here's the uh, percent of uh, subjects agreeing that risk factors, that these are risk factors for RA. And we were a little disconcerted that smoking, which we've written many papers about, which apparently they're not reading, only a third of patient of subjects agreed that smoking was a risk factor for RA. Again, highly educated, motivated group that wanted to participate in a prevention study. Um, the other ones we weren't super surprised about, that they didn't know that these were related to RA risk. Uh, but assuredly, uh, reassuringly, we did educate those, and it was differential across the pre-RA group. Those that got the intervention did increase compared to the comparison. This is just showing the six-month time point. But really, at every time point, they had increased their knowledge of RA risk factors. Um, so I'm about to wrap up. The strengths of our study, obviously, this is a randomized controlled trial. Um, we had comprehensive RA risk estimates that included multiple factors. Um, this web-based pre-RA tool could be widely implemented. Um, I didn't mention this, but actually, the pre-RA group versus the, the pre-RA alone group did very similarly. So it could be implemented without absolutely needing the health educator. Uh, the limitations, obviously, this is a single study, single center. There were participants who were well-educated. They were motivated to participate. We obviously couldn't blind education strategies. Um, certainly, you could think about other factors that may have affected our pre-RA risk estimates. Um, and of course, logistics, as far as I have to say that a lot of the participants wanted to participate to, to know their genetics and know what their autoantibodies were. 
Um, so if you wanted to implement that, that would probably affect the, the population as far as how motivated they were um, and how to actually get that tested and back to the uh, subject. So our conclusions, uh, disclosure of RA risk personalized to all of these risk factors, increased motivation to change RA risk-related behavior. They were 23% more likely to increase motivation over time. This effect persisted for six months after education. The subjects at high RA risk were most motivated to improve health behaviors, um, and they were more likely to report improvements in dental hygiene and dietary intake after this tool. Um, and then few relatives identified RA risk factors at baseline, which means that there's a lot of opportunity to uh, perhaps uh, change health behaviors, uh, and which could change RA risk. Um, and this was successful, however, in educating about these RA risk factors, and it sustained over the year-long intervention. Um, and this is really sort of a proof of principle study where, um, you know, this is a study where we integrated a lot of different risk factors into one summary estimate, and the hope is, is that it makes people adopt a healthier lifestyle, um, but it also could find people that are at higher risk and could need sort of more specialized screening efforts because we are looking at genetics and we are finding these antibodies which really put people at very high risk. So this is really sort of a, obviously a, a, a new era where, of personalized medicine where we're wondering of how these, just the fact of telling people about their risk, how it can affect their behaviors and downstream health uh, behaviors. Uh, so obviously I want to thank the uh, participants in our study and the patients that helped us recruit, uh, as well as the rheumatologists and staff in clinic, uh, as well as all the other co-investigators, and of course uh, NIH and NIAMS, and I'll look forward to your questions. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, sorry, the phone started ringing. <laughs> okay. Uh, really interesting, uh, sort of like a hybrid with preventative and personalized medicine hybrid kind of thing. Um, I did have a question about the uh, analysis. You said that arms two and three were combined, right? And that was pre-analysis. That was Correct. done. Yeah, we can wanted you, to see what the active. I, I would just, I'm just thinking that 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 one-on-one -on -one interaction with a mm -hmm. healthcare is is a powerful tool that I thought might make a difference. Yep, we did pre-specify to combine the groups because we were really most interested in about the act of disclosing the personalized information. And we did do a secondary analysis where we compared the pre-RA arm to the pre-RA plus arm. Um, and they weren't statistically different, but actually numerically the, the web-only arm outperformed the pre-RA group. I don't know if you can make that conclusion that it's superior or inferior or, or not because it wasn't our our pre-specified hypothesis, but at least numerically, it didn't seem to have a, a very powerful impact. Just surprising. Hi, thank you. Um, oops. I'm wondering, um, you know, folks are looking at uh, the effects of exercise on cognitive processing and um, mental health in general, and I'm wondering if you know of studies or people who are looking at disclosure risk factors for Alzheimer's or other um, neurological disorders where that, um, maybe Alzheimer's is not the best example, but where um, exercise and changes to diet and so on would, this model would be applicable? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, one of our collaborators listed here, Robert Green, um, has done a lot of work about um, how telling people about their genetic risk for Alzheimer's might affect their, you know, um, anxiety levels. Um, and I believe that they're doing a study now where I think there's less known about sort of behavioral risk factors for Alzheimer's. Um, there is some literature about uh, diet and physical activity. Um, but they're doing a similar study where they're basically telling them that these are the risk factors and not perhaps looking at it as an intense intervention of our, as ours, where really the whole intervention was about motivation, um, but really just telling them what the risk factor was and then measuring it afterwards. Um, so I don't know if those results are published yet, but I know that's an active area of investigation for his team. And we do hope that this is not something that's just applicable for rheumatoid arthritis. We think it certainly should be able to be applied to many other chronic diseases or other health conditions. I'm Christine Hunter. I'm the Deputy Director at OBSSR, and I'm going to say a few concluding remarks. I do get that I'm the, the barrier between you and the end of the day, so I'll try to keep them brief. Um, 
I think the first thing I want to say is it really, you know, coming into this room this morning and seeing all the faces, many of them familiar, some unfamiliar, it's really a reminder of how diverse and rich our behavioral and social science research community is at NIH. And I hope you experienced that and felt the same thing today. Um, I also really want to extend a lot of thank yous, uh, particularly to our session speakers and the keynote speaker. Our session speakers were all selected out of a much larger group of investigators nominated by NIH staff. Um, and I think they really did an outstanding job. Um, I also want to thank the people that went, um, that did all the planning for this meeting. Um, so this is almost a full year's worth of planning. Um, so our, the planners from our office, Kate McNeil, Dana Schlosser, and then Erica Moore, who's our communication director and helped with a lot of uh, the outreach activities. And then our really important coordinating committee reps, um, Alfonso Latoni from NIHS, Michael Stirrup from NIMH, and Augie Diana from NINR couldn't have done a better job in really helping shape this day and think about how to, how to have an exciting day of science. So if we could just say a round of applause for those folks. And then I'm gonna to try to do some quick summaries. I really will try to keep them brief, but just, you know, I think, I was really struck by what a rich day of science it was, starting with session one, um, kind of thinking about the importance of understanding those fundamental cognitive and emotional processes, but then really taking it from there to think about that next generation of intervention. How can we have more targeted intervention? How can we think about specific behavioral phenotypes and matching our interventions to those phenotypic differences? Then moving into session two in our keynote, really thinking about public health and policy drivers, kind of factors outside of direct health care, um, and thinking about you know, health outcomes in at-risk populations from cash transfers to tobacco marketing, food insecurity, um, very exciting. And then session three, you know, really coming back to this idea of personalized medicine in application, um, whether it's a novel intervention um, for a personalized approach to physical activity, um, thinking about ambulatory biofeedback as a way to give kind of real-time uh, behavior change information, and then kind of the more traditional personalized medicine approach, of, but thinking about how that genetic risk and behavioral risk um, can influence motivation for behavior change, not just thinking about kind of, you know, no novel drug targets. So I thought that was really exciting. Um, and then I, I will keep this brief, but one of the things we did want to do is we really appreciated your participation and um, active involvement in the roundtables. And we will um, have a formal report out, so we'll have more information about kind of all the feedback, trying to summarize that. Um, but um, I was asked to do kind of a quick debrief to give you sort of the highlights of what came out of those um, roundtable groups. And as the facilitators uh, and, and I met at the, uh, at the end of your sessions, we were really struck by kind of these three cross-cutting topics. So despite the fact that the questions were all very different, um, these themes uh, came, came through in many of the sessions. And thinking about this interdisciplinary integration, not only within the NIH, um, doing a better job at that, um, but also thinking about doing that from kind of early training throughout uh, careers and, and you know, looking at all different kinds of levels. Then it was, uh, the other thing that was interesting is this, this um, point about grassroots engagement and how we need to do a better job of that. And a lot of times I think we think about uh, grassroots engagement of communities and participants, and certainly that came up as well. Um, but there was also this idea of thinking carefully about engaging stakeholders at all levels of science. So if we're thinking about healthcare practice change, how can we think about engaging those healthcare practitioners? Um, or if we're thinking about um, uh, uh, thinking about policy decisions, how can we think about how policymakers are, are accessing and understanding evidence-based information? And then the final uh, kind of cross-cutting topic was this kind of thinking about approaches to address structural issues in the way we conduct research. Um, and so just I'll, I'll go to a few of the highlights. Um, you know, one of the, the things in, in, in the question about how to increase the relevance of behavioral and social science at the NIH was thinking carefully about how we can encourage behavioral and social scientists at all levels of NIH, including in leadership positions, um, and really thinking about uh, how we might research this question. So if we want to increase the relevance, how do we understand what the perceptions are now and what are the barriers to that integration so that the things that we decide to do in the future are evidence-based. So I really liked that. 
Um, in terms of understudied areas, a lot of the, the topics that came up were, focus, were areas of focus that are not traditionally or haven't, they were traditionally in our fields, but haven't always traditionally been thought of as um, influencing health. So things like safety and violence, social determinants, literacy, um, and an emphasis on more dissemination and implementation research. Um, again, there was this idea of focusing on structural issues um, uh, at the NIH so that uh, experts in these areas were encouraged to be a part of reviews, that these things were encouraged to be integrated into many areas of research. Um, in terms of the integration of basic and applied, a lot of the uh, discussion focused around uh, opportunities for information exchange, but not just this is what I do, that's what you do, that's good, but also thinking about how to really do that cross-discipline communication and translation. And then thinking about person-centered, patient-centered, both uh, questions and design, uh, so that the things that we're uh, evaluating are also driven by kind of the, the lived experience. Um, and then, of course, thinking about training models. Um, in the training group, I thought it was interesting. They, in addition to a lot of really creative and specific ideas about linking, you know, how do we link uh, T32s so that they're collaborating better, kind of that grassroots networking, thinking about how to have our turnaround times for funding more rapid um, so we can meet the student timelines, but also thinking about how we need to train for soft skills in addition to um, kind of those uh, transdisciplinary skills. So not only what is the science, how do you interact with other scientists, but how do you work in a multidisciplinary team and be effective? Um, and then in terms of uh, the question for challenges for translating into practice, again, there was an emphasis on policy and economic research, more of a focus on the D in dissemination and implementation, so how can users make sense of kind of the volume of information, the conflicting information, where do they even get their information, and what does evidence base mean? Um, and then uh, in the methods, measures, and analysis section, really focused on what you might imagine is interdisciplinary training, but also the need to co-calibrate our measures so that we can uh, crosswalk studies, um, integrate different levels of data, and then think about attention to bias and how we collect data. So even if it's the same kind of measure, you know, the people that are collecting it, the approach um, to collection, that kind of thing. So that is my quick and dirty summary of the, the, the discussion that we had post the roundtables, but we expect there's lots more that I was certainly not able to cover or cover well. But again, we appreciate you being here today. Um, we look forward to next year's festival, and um, if you're interested in uh, being a part of that planning, do let us know, because we're going to be doing debriefing soon and getting started on next year. But that's all I have to say. Just thank you very much. And again, please, a big round of applause for the speakers and the planners.